Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And welcome to a brand new week of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Man, do we got a good one to kick off this week. Max Hawthorne is here. You know him as a as an author of Kronos Rising. Well, he's having some strange stuff happen at his house. And we're going to find out everything about that. And we got all of you here as well, which is always a nice little, how can we say that? A nice little sugar on the, the fruit. You know what I'm saying? You just pour a little sugar on the fruit, make it sweet. And that's all of you. You're the sweetness. Monday night, we have race fan in the gold medal position, Deidre with a silver and SJ with a bronze medal tonight. Let us say hello to Michael Morris, Robert Lamoth, Chris 716, Laura Lobbs, Karen in the Woot Train. How are you? Number 37 in your program, starting at left wing from Stockholm, Sweden, Lars Janssen. Yeah. Oh, Dirty Filth has just come in. All right. Les Paul Holland strumming away. James Horn, Deer Slayer. Good to see you both. Rach Beal from the UK. Good morning to you, my fellow Commonwealther. And there's Tim Mothman and his goatee. Mama Catherine. Mwah! Mama Catherine will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Let's continue on. Leafy Nebula. What's happening? Let's continue on. T-Bone, my man, Cosmic Joe, W. Decker is back. W. Decker will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Luscious Jewels, good to see you. Wild Berry, thank you for coming on in. Digger Dog, Bolenia, my man, good to see you guys. As we continue on with Roll Call, there's Noble Patrick hanging on out. As we scroll on down, Ozzy Ozzy, nice to see you. How's tomorrow? Please let me know. Purple haired Pixie Lara. Nice to see you. As we continue on with our roll call here, let us uh, say hello to Corey and Bar Madison. Who's on Facebook? Who's hiding there? It's Ozzy Ange. How are you, Ozzy Ange? Nice to see you. And who else do we have? Uh, Dizzy F and Reed. Eternity Eternal. Good to see you both. And. Christine Lynn, Len Dorman, nice to have you here. Super knower, slow motion. How are you doing? And who else is here? River Morris, nice to have you back. And Bielza Brad, has a devil put aside for me? Good to see you, my man. And who else do we have here? Woo Desert Rat, nice to have you both here. And who else is here? Let's see here. Hmm. Preacher, holy cow, the preacher has returned, people. Give us a bow, preacher. Skip to my Lou, nice to have you here. Just another guy named Harry, the ferret. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Lee the B, American Patriot. How you guys doing? Charles Wempe, good to see you. And W. Decker, thank you for kicking off the super chat tonight, my man. Very much appreciate your love and support continually. Really helps us out. Thank you very much. Scrolling on down, we have, let's see, who, who's welcoming me to the shooting club? Oh, it's Ozzy Ange. Yeah, Ozzy Ange. Welcoming me. Susan Alloway. Oh, it's the man with 7,386 podcasts. Brian Bowden's here, everybody. 
Yep. Brian Effin Bowden. Scrolling on down. We got Maureen Green. Nice to see you. Hi, Mike Rivers. Phil the Stalker. Richard Hauser. Let's get the radio side going. Hello and welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. This is the podcast and radio side of the show. And we are glad to have you here. Max Max Hawthorne is joining us. Kronos Rising author. We're getting into some strange stuff that's happening at his house. We're in the middle of roll call. And Bill WD40 has entered the chat room. He is officially lubing us up for tonight's show. Because you always want to go into a show nice and smooth. You never, ever, ever want it to be, you know, rigid. Rigid sucks. Yeah, it does. And so welcome, Bill. Lube us up, buddy. And who else is here? Scrolling on down. Mm, Brown Dwarf, nice to see you, buddy. And I think we're caught up. I think we are caught up. Hey, it's going to be a great show. Don't forget, you can also shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. I've added some new swag. I want to believe t-shirts. And for the ladies, Bigfoot bait clothing. Here we go. Horns up. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a power show of fun for you tonight. Max Hawthorne is back talking about high strangeness around his house. Then in hour number three, Steve Stockton from Among the Missing kicks things off. UFO Court will be in session with Courtney Marcassati. Max Hawthorne is an author and screenwriter referred to as the Prince of Paleo Fiction. He's best known for his Kronos Rising series of sci-fi suspense thrillers, which have garnered Book of the Year, People's Choice Awards. He's an Amazon number one best-selling author of the cryptid research book, Monster and Marine Mysteries. Yeah, usually he's scaring the hell out of me talking about Megalodon and all sorts of sea monsters like Kraken. But tonight, we're getting into something different. You see, Max has a mystery going on at his home. And we're going to try and figure out what is truly going on. And it's always a pleasure to have Max Hawthorne here on Spaced Out Radio. Max, good to see you again. How you been? Great to be back, brother, man. I think think the last time we were here, we were talking about the Megalodon being a scavenger at everything, if memory serves. It's been a while. Yeah, usually that you see the megalodons. The reason why I don't go in the ocean doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's a pinky toe or one of them warm puddles on the beach after the tide is out. Nope, no, nope. because the minute I go in there, man, literally, if I step in there, yep, that's when megalodon's gonna hit. I know. <laughs> you, know you know, there's just no point. You scare the Jesus out of me, man. I'd be more afraid of a bull shark, honestly, than a megalodon. I mean, I'm not taking. It. The I'm not taking the chance, dude. I'm just not. Seawater is dangerous. It dangerous. Is. We are earthbound terrestrial creatures. We are slow as slugs in the water. And worst part about the ocean, you're on the surface. You never see it coming. You know. You, you know what? I had a buddy of mine who went ocean fishing on the west coast of Vancouver Island one day. It was him and his buddy, and the fishing guide. And all of a sudden, something hits their line. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And we're talking like 300 pound test line. So usually 300 pound test line, you know, you could battle a fish of a thousand plus pounds. No problem. Yes. Okay. If you know what you're and, doing. And it snaps the line like it's dental floss. Mm-hmm. Then hits the other fishing line on the boat and mm-hmm. snaps it like dental floss as well. So he turns to his buddy or the fishing guy and he says, what, what the hell do you think that was? And he goes, no idea. We're in the open ocean here, a couple miles off of shore. He goes, it could be anything from a whale to a great white Mm -hmm. to a submarine. We'll never know. Uh, You you actually, we talked about that when we were doing the Megalon scavenger thing. And, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, I would have to say first, the question is, is number one, how was his drag set? You know, like the drag when the line gets pulled off the reel, because if you if his drag was cranked, so it was going to go past 300 pounds, then any really large fish could break that line. Or oh, did they look at the leader and then see, was it bitten through? Because if they didn't have a steel leader or a titanium leader and you've got something with razor sharp teeth, like a great white, you know, it's going to grab and just bite right through your leader anyway. 300 pound mono is nothing for a large shark to bite through. I, it's oh, yeah. happened to me many times, you know, if you're not expecting a shark and that that type of thing. But yeah, I'm sure it was an interesting experience. Definitely. Well, you know, you know what? Up here, the water's colder, but every now and again, when the water warms up, the great whites come up. And right. I'm just not taking that chance. Not taking that chance whatsoever. Well, I'm a get, meal. There are more and more of them, actually, now. Their numbers are starting to rebound, thankfully. So. Well, I'm not saying they're not a beautiful fish. Mm-hmm. Okay? I think they are gorgeous. You know, to me, they're the ultimate predator. They really are, you know, but, and I don't want to see them harmed. All I'm saying is I'm not putting myself in that situation. Okay. I wouldn't yeah. advise it. Yeah. No, 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 no. I've no, only no. seen one, one while fishing and it was quite uh, a sight to see the size of a large Buick, you know, yeah. passed under yeah. the boat. We were all like, whoa. And nope. it's back when there were so few of them. That you yep. see one like that was such a rarity. I also had a captain who had a 130 pound blue shark taken by one and it ran off and bit through it, the, the blue shark, and all that was left on the on the hook on his boat was a head, the head of the blue yeah. shark. Yeah, see, that's wrong. You don't need that stuff. Yeah. You know, which which really bugs me because I literally want one of my dreams is to go to the East Coast and go fishing for them giant blue fin tuna to get mm-hmm. to like three, four, five hundred pounds. But that's right in great white territory. And I'm not doing that. I've seen the size of those boats. You know, they may be 40, 30, 40, 50 feet long. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you know what? Jaws could take it down. We've seen it happen in the movie. Just not doing it. Always are on the side of caution. You got that right. And always know where the exit doors are. Which on a boat can be difficult. Yeah. No. Not at all. Not I see these idiots, you know, kayaking. I watched one today, right mm-hmm. before the show. Kayaking in the middle of the ocean somewhere in Cali- California. And what happens? A 15-foot great white comes up to the kayak. Mm-hmm. And this guy's like, what do I do? What do I do? He's screaming at his buddy, what do I do? What do I do? How about you don't go out that far? Well, I'm assuming that the white shark was checking to see if it was a seal or not. You know, luckily it didn't do the the usual, you know, test bite or even worse, actually come up and bam, because that is that. They're they're so gorgeous, though. They are. By the way, I know how much people love the last time I was on me eating popcorn on the show. So I actually brought the one of the popcorn buckets we take to the movies with us. So I can fully prepared this time. You know, nice, Mm -hmm. nice. All right. Well, we didn't bring you on to talk sharks tonight. You know, you're a guy who covers a lot of things. And and it, when we come back from the break at the bottom of the hour, we are going to get into all of this weird supernatural stuff that has all of a sudden popped up around your house. You know, and I find this pretty amazing. I, I saw the footage, and yeah. I don't know what the heck it is because we'll describe it later on. But has your house always had paranormal activity? Yeah, so, so let, I don't want to clarify that first. You keep saying it's my house, and it's not. I thought it was here. I thought it no, was here. I, no, I specifically said that it was a private residence in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And okay. It's in a, heavily, a heavily wooded area. See, I have a strict rule when it comes to these type of entities, et cetera, that I don't want anybody in my house. 
you see, because the problem is, is like a lot of them are not allowed in unless it's like a vampire, unless you invite them in. And if something, if you invite something in, then you have a problem because then you have a hard time getting it out. Understand? So no, okay. where this was like, I don't, that's not my house there, but it is uh, in Bucks County, which I also live in Bucks County. I mean, it's a big county, but uh, the, uh, I was actually there and uh I, I've been hunting. Um, you probably know about the incident that happened back in 2016 where my daughter and I encountered this winged creature that had been injured and was lying on a street. I don't know if we ever talked about that. Maybe we didn't. No. no uh, we didn't. I've been on shows talking about it. Well, we, we did back in 2016. I think it was November 22nd to be exact. Coming home after school. I picked her up from aftercare. We were driving home through this. Uh, it was in a, the, the same general area in a development, that's, it's, but it's very woodsy. And uh, obviously dark, you know, nighttime, and a little blustery, and some flurries and stuff. And there was something lying in the middle of the street. And at first, I had thought it was a box. It was a dark object, about like yay big. And so I had said, uh, "Oh, we got something in the road there," you know. And uh, so she leaned over. She was only seven at the time, and we were, you know, I started crawling towards it with the intentions of straddling it, because it could have been a box of nails. You know, you don't want to drive over a box of nails or something like that, you know, with your tires and stuff. And as I was creeping towards it, the box started to move. See, now Bucks County is notorious for having all sorts of sightings, creatures, etc. Dogman sightings, there's more than you could, you know, shake a stick at. Uh, there's been some Bigfoot stuff and a lot of other weird things. Well, this one goes under the weird things category. And so this thing, it started to move. And I thought, well, it's windy. And if it's a box, that must be the flap of the box. And that's why it's getting taller, you know, but it wasn't the flap of a box. It was something that was kind of pushing itself up, right? It had been lying like face down in the street. I guess it got maybe hit by another car or maybe it, you know, struck a power line or an owl took a swipe at it. I don't know, you know, but we both saw it and I was looking at it and it was, well, first, the first thing is, is when I saw it, and I saw its face, it was like gray, dark gray, black eyes, black mouth, kind of bristly looking. And it was very upset. And it had this like screeching look on its face. Like it was like, like, ah, like that. And my brain, I stopped now and I'm staring at it, holding the steering. I'm like, you know, me, I, I have, I know a lot about the natural world and assorted wildlife, et cetera, from the Northeast. And my brain was going at light speed, like the Archimedes computer in the Cronus Rising books, trying to analyze the animal kingdom and figure out what the heck I'm looking at. And it wasn't anything, you know, it wasn't a possum, it wasn't a ground, it wasn't a rabbit, it wasn't this, that, 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 that. You know, the head was about the size of an apple. And then uh, I literally said out loud, like, what the H-E-L-L -L is that, which normally I wouldn't do in front of my daughter, but it slipped out. And then it, it just sprang up in the air and wings came out. And it was hovering about six feet in the air, about maybe 20 feet from my headlights. You know, oh and then my. it took on this. Yeah, yeah. It was right. If I had had a dash cam, Dave, I would have been, it would have been dead center, like posing. Okay. And these wings were like membranous, clear wings, like you see on a dragonfly. But how tall was it? Um, I'm guessing it was 12 inches to maybe 18 inches tall on a guess. Oh my. The body. But the wingspan was like three to four feet. It had large wings proportionate to its body, which we do expect with a bird or a bat or something like that. But this wasn't right. that. And the body started becoming very, like, it was different in the air. It was like kind of silvery white, almost ethereal looking, like much prettier, you know? So I don't know if it was camouflage when it was sitting on the tarmac, we'll call it. You know, and it, it tried to take on the color of the asphalt, like a dark gray. And maybe it was its natural color or it was changing its appearance. You know, a lot of beings will change how they look even in an illusory manner to make a human being more comfortable when they you know when you come across them they don't want to look as scary let's say you know what i mean like like if you saw something and it had fangs and like ah like that versus it was very pleasant looking you know it, you know your reaction oh max froze up he froze up right there He's having uh, some computer issues tonight, so we're trying to get through those. But I think, uh, you know, I mean, could you imagine driving along? You know, you're with your kid, and you're just trying to have a, a good time, you know, relaxing, chilling out, ha maybe have some ice cream cone or something, and then something that looks just absolutely out of something the devil would create jumps off the road and starts hovering there, waving its wings. 
that just doesn't make sense. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. And, you know, when, when you have these, these type of interactions with creatures, you know, I, I really do believe that, and Max will be back here momentarily, guys. He's just resetting everything. Um, I, you know, when you have these instances that just happen out of nowhere, you ever notice that certain people are like magnets to this stuff? That, that here they are, you know, they have one strange thing happen, and all, all of a sudden, uh, there they are with with all of these strange creatures that shouldn't exist. Max, I mean, this thing hovering there and flying around, it doesn't look like a bat. I mean, you're a pretty observant guy. Mm -hmm. You, know, you kind of know what's going on. I uh -huh. mean, what made you think it wasn't a bat, that it was something out of the spawns of hell? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, first, by the way, I apologize. But you see, unfortunately, sometimes for some reason, when I do certain shows, it seems like a higher authority is trying tries to interfere. I mean, when I was on Richard Surrett's Strange Planet and we were recording, ten minutes in, bam, the whole development internet, internet I mean, power went out in my whole development. And then I tried getting back on in six minutes. It came back on, and we I was reaching out to him, and then boom, it was out for hours. So I mean, it's like crazy stuff like this starts happening um i knew it wasn't a bat because it had translucent wings like an insect they were literally like i said three to four feet across and uh, but they were like long tapered ovals and the thing was it looked very pretty in the air like that i mean the headlights were hitting it and the outlines of its wings were like like the light was like glowing around it like that and everything and it was just suspended there like like this like like a hummingbird you know or something and i'm staring at it and then my daughter pointed and she goes, it's a fairy, daddy. It's a fairy like that. And then I think either it saw her or it was like breaking rules. I don't know what, but all of a sudden it like shifted and then it went and it was gone. And it was an incredible flyer, even injured. I mean, like, like, forget it. Like you wouldn't believe how fast it was gone. And then I was just like talking to myself, like the rest of the drive to the house. Like muttering in myself, you know, you start like, like, is everything real? Like in, in one of those Twilight movies, when the girl finds out that werewolves are real, she already knew about vampires, are all the legends real, that type of stuff. And, you know, it was a very sobering experience, honestly. But uh, so my point is, is that since then, I had started trying to like get footage of one of these entities or creatures. You know, so I would like put out trail cameras in the woods in that area and stuff like that. If I knew people, you know, and maybe behind their houses that border the woods, this type of stuff. And I was there and this is how like I ended up getting handsome, as I call him, on video that night and all that. I know we're going to be, uh, you know, taking a break in a few minutes. But um, so, you know, it was the, 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 the fairy. Um, and my understanding is <clears throat> from people, that's what it was, was not it's not like Tinkerbell. You know, I mean, like, if people get, um, if you go on, get a copy of Monsters and Marine Mysteries, the book, there's a section on there about this. And there is a drawing I did the moment I walked in the door of exactly what happened with the, you know, the windshield and the flurries and it suspended there. And then there's a close up I drew. Luckily, I used to be an artist and an animator and stuff, so I can draw. But I drew uh, as best as I could what its face looked like. And it was, it was, you know, you, you wouldn't want to go out and grab this thing. Let's put it that way. It would bite your finger off or who knows what. So. Did it anyway. have fangs? Did it look very <laughs> vampirish? You know, you couldn't really see teeth. The mouth was really open and blackish. And it was like I said, screeching. Like it was either angry or frightened. And if you were hurt lying in the street. All right, Max is frozen up again, and hopefully we'll get him back here momentarily. Once again, we apologize for the technical errors on that, but I still don't know how I would imagine doing that. I mean, I've seen some weird crap in my day, but nothing with translucent wings that are about three to four feet long and 18 to 20 inch body. I mean, on the flip side, wouldn't you like to put a fishing hook in that and toss it out into the water to see what you can hook? Telling you, you could get some big sturgeon with that. That's for sure. Maybe a big catfish. Mm, they'd be going crazy for that. Fresh food. Hey, I'm a fisherman. I, I like fishing. What am I supposed to say? Of course, I'm going to think about that. But uh, in regards to 
you know, that type of sighting. And what I was saying before, it it's just weird how some people are just magnets to this stuff. And I think because Max has done the deep dive into these subjects and is very open-minded about it, this is where I say I believe the phenomenon has something to do with that. The phenomenon really can seem to control what you see and where. Now, maybe not for everybody, but for some who seem to go deep, deep, deep into that rabbit hole of these strange creatures, I think that they seem to pop up and make things happen and give themselves a sighting. Max, what I was saying, and I, and I explained to our audience, you're having some technical errors here, but it's not me. Thinking. I'm telling it's not me. Okay. It's, it's just, you know, your, your show is being interfered with like for, you know, for some reason, by the way, I got my, I love you like a, like a Hobbit love second breakfast mug going on. Also, I'm not yeah. selling these. So don't get the wrong idea. I just think it's cute. I, I want to ask you, you see a lot of, and you deal with a lot of strange topics, okay? Yes. And we all know that if you believe in the phenomenon, mm -hmm. the phenomenon can mess with you. Like maybe we're being messed with technically tonight, mm -hmm. okay? Do you think that you saw this creature and other creatures of the sort because you've kind of taken that dive down the rabbit hole in researching everything weird and strange that shouldn't exist? I think some people um, have latent abilities that enable them to see things that they're not supposed to be able to see. And I think that once that becomes apparent to entities, I think they're more likely to reach out to make contact because you're not, you know, uh, one of the sheep walking around with blinders on, let's say, you know, like after that, it happened when it warmed up a little bit, my daughter and I had gone into the woods in that area. We brought a bowl of delicious Costco blueberries and we uh, found for some reason, like a couple hundred, a hundred yards or more into the forest. It was a lone tree stump there for some reason, perfectly flat, like a table, you know, and uh, we put the bowl on there and we sat down on some fallen trees, logs. And, you know, I did a little speech. I was a little embarrassed, like, you know, saying, you know, we, we, brought you something and if you want to speak to us or anything like that you know i felt very silly i was also armed because you know my mama didn't raise a fool and i'm not going into the woods there you know without the ability to defend myself i worry more about two-legged you know predators than four if you know what i'm saying but yes uh, and nothing happened although it was kind of eerie and quiet and all that and we, I, we left the bowl and she asked me to go back you know like uh, the next day or whatever after I dropped over school and I did and the bowl was still there it was a heavy plastic bowl but it was empty spotless you know now and you know you could say okay well animals ate that but you would think like if squirrels or deer shove their face in there and they started eating blueberries you'd have you know blueberry stained juice scraps of skin the bowl would be dislodged it was like just empty spotless you know, and so I had been on one show and I said, but, you know, some teenagers maybe walking through the woods would like, I don't know, uh, you know, eat them. And then the host was like, right, because if you were walking through the woods and you saw a bowl of blueberries there, you would stop and eat them. And then I was laughing because it reminded me of that Shrek movie, like donkey, if you find a plate of fresh waffles in the middle of the woods with butter and syrup, don't you find that a little strange? You know, that type of thing. And it is so. Anyway, but, uh, you know, who knows what, but I think that might have kind of, you know, brought something's attention my way. Well, it could very well have, mm -hmm. you know, and when we come back from the break here at the bottom of the hour, we're going to be going into this property that you have seen some incredible happenings in Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know how to explain this weirdness. I've seen the video. And, you know, unfortunately for our radio audience, we can't play the video here, but you could go to Max's website, chronosrising.com. Actually, and, it's maxhawthorne.com. Or is it at Max Hawthorne? Okay. Yeah, maxhawthorne.com Max Hawthorne. and check it on out. Max Hawthorne, author, researcher, investigator on Spaced Out Radio. We'll be right back with more right after this, everybody.
Hello, Chris. Teen, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Hi, Dirty Filth. What are you what are you doing with that black thing? What is that black thing? What is that? Bring that back for a second. Sorry, I'm trying to get this. I know. It takes you about my page. Takes you about three minutes just to unmute your microphone. What was that black thing you were just using? Oh my uh, work knife. Oh work in a warehouse, you gotta cut boxes a lot. Yeah. Dr. Dan Villiers, welcome to SOR chat, listening in on X. Little Debbie, nice to see you. Paisley Parker, thanks for coming on in. Uh, just want to let everybody know, where is it here? Tomorrow night... I will at uh, 9 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Pacific. I will be on the Monsters Lounge with Tressa and Jenny talking all weird stuff, strange stuff. Yeah, I guess that's on YouTube. I'll see if I can find a link for it here. Hold on. Let's see here. I should probably hit uh, subscribe on that one. Yeah. They don't have a lot of subscribers, but you know what? They're making great content, these ladies. I'll get, I'll put the link on here. There's the link for tomorrow, 7 p.m. Pacific. Midnight or 9. What is that? Three hours. 10 p.m. Eastern. I'll give them a follow. Yeah. I just did as well. So make sure you go hit subscribe. Tell them where you're coming from. I hope everybody had a good Easter weekend. The Easter Bunny came here. I'm uh, holding off my strength and not eating any chocolate. We're stealing any from my son. Did you have a ham, Dave? No, we didn't do a dinner. We didn't do, uh, you know, didn't do a dinner. I had, had a beans. I had stuffed peppers. Ooh, that's always good. Yeah, stuffed peppers. Yeah, it was really good. I threw some garlic hot sauce on them. Just made it extra perfect. Oh, I love garlic. Garlic mm. goes on everything. Mostly. Mm. Garlic goes on everything. Oh, Preacher's made his way over to to uh, Spreaker to hang out with Bill WD-40. Probably needed to get lubed up for something. I'm not sure. Yep, went shooting at yesterday at the range. That was fun. Who did you all go? Did you go with Merle? No, I went with Little Marky Spender. And my buddy Phil and Pauline, they were they've been guests on this show. Merle's probably hunting ghosts anyways. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got about uh thirty five seconds before forty seconds before we come back. Little Maxi Hawthorne is here. Where's Blob tonight, Filth? She's currently laying on the back of the couch downstairs. 
tried to get her up and she just gave me a dirty look. Diva. Just a complete yeah. diva. All right. Uh, Mama Catherine, uh, we're just shooting targets. That's what we were shooting. And Audacious uh, Amber's off to bed, everybody. Make sure we all say good night to her. And um yeah here we go in five seconds thank you w decker and t-bone for the super chats here we go here we go with the second half hour of spaced out radio tonight my name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears. We appreciate you tuning us on in. I want to remind all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, and we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Max Hawthorne is back with another interesting story he always brings to the table when he's on this show. This time, he's investigating a house that is seeming to have some weird and high strangeness. How did you come across this case, Max? Um, by the way, uh, I saw the things that says I was muted, so I hope everybody can hear me now. Yep, everybody's got you. Cool. I don't know why that happens either. I didn't do that. But anyway, um, it's not a matter of uh, it being this particular house. I, like I was mentioning, I would put out cameras and stuff different places. And so I happened to be at this particular house that night, and uh, I had a uh, trail camera affixed to a deck post on the deck, obviously, like where the stairs come down and the woods are like to the left of that, maybe 30 feet to the left, something like that. And uh, this happened around, oh, I was late, like maybe three or four in the morning, something like that. And uh, they have uh, a cat, uh, kind of like our huge Siberians, which hopefully you'll get to meet Chunky Cheese, a.k.a. Olaf, a.k.a. Gray Slayer. And one day I'll tell you why I call him Gray Slayer. But anyway, he's uh, napping over there. But their cat was uh, pawing at this window and stuff, you know, like quite vociferously. So I decided to go out on the deck. And the problem is, is I've been trying to get footage of these, this winged thing, this winged creature, you know, for on and off for years. You know, I mean, this happened back in 2016, that first thing. And this was... Uh, last February that this finally happened. And recently, shortly before that, I had gotten a few frames at that particular house of one of those things flying. Like literally, it was so fast that it, when it bolted by the, the screen, the trail camera, didn't barely had time to turn on. And I got like two or three frames of it at the corner flying through and you could see the four wings. And I was like, fantastic, but it was so brief. So I figured it might be one of them. So I went out on the deck. In retrospect, it was probably pretty stupid. But this is why women live longer than men because we do stupid things. Okay. So I go out on the deck there and, uh, I was like right behind the trail camera there and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And I figured, you know, I'm going to wait for this thing to show itself or whatever. And then I'm going to turn on the camera, you know? And then I started getting this weird feeling like it was like a wave of cold hits you. And when people go to the website there, which by the way, you do have to uh, subscribe to, you know, see the video and the other videos coming, but, uh, it's not expensive, but anyway, um, the, uh, like there was a wave of cold. And when you see the video, you'll see, if you noticed it towards the end, the temperature shift as the entity pulls away from me. So as it comes towards you, the temperature drops and you also get this sort of prickly feeling like, um, like static or maybe like, um, when like a, a storm front is coming towards you, like, you know, heavy electricity in the air, that kind of thing. And so, you know, you start getting the hair on the back of your neck coming up and stuff. So I, like what I call um, flash the camera, meaning I took my hand in front of it and I went like this. So I turned it on and I'm waiting, expecting one of these things to bolt through the tree line or something like that. You know, nothing seemed to happen. So then I was like, huh? And then it was getting a little creepy out there for my taste, you know, and stuff, you know. So I went back inside, whatever. But the next day when I got the camera, the footage 
and everything, I that's when I saw what you've seen in the video. There was this big energy field, which the human eye cannot see, that but the infrared camera could pick up on, and it has this cyclone. It looks like of energy just swirling around like this, around this being. And at first, when I first saw it, as I mentioned in the documentary, I thought, okay, you know, there, I mean, I knew there was no fog and there was no, you know, mist and there was no precipitation or wind. And all this is, you know, explored as you've seen in there and everything, you know, and there was no weather balloon. It wasn't swamp gas and it wasn't Jack the Ripper. Let's throw a little, you know, since you love Jaws so much and everything like that. But, uh, you know, the only thing I could think of was maybe that an insect of some kind, its wing might have, you know, like, a translucent wing got it with a lens, but it's freezing out and winter time and only winter moths are the only winter insects I'm aware of. And their wings aren't translucent. I mean, aren't transparent, you know? And, uh, but the more I looked at it, the more I started like, this is very odd. And it's, it sort of seemed to have like a shape to it. And as I started playing around with the contrast and stuff, the field started to shrink. And the more the contrast was upped and people who know anything about increasing contrast, you know, when you do that, it makes brights brighter and darks darker, see? So the field started changing until it becomes humanoid in shape. So you can literally see there's like, it's like a Facebook, you know, when you don't have a, like if your thing says Facebook user and you don't have like a, an image, it has like, you know, like head, neck, shoulder shape. And it started looking like that. And then I started getting deeper into it and going frame by frame by frame. And that's when the faces started jumping out and stuff that you saw. So had this person had a lot of paranormal activity around their home? No, I, uh, I just kind of invite myself over, <laughs> <laughs> but the area, like I said, in Bucks County is known for stuff. You know, that same, like I've had multiple incidents at that particular residence there with these beings, but I think it's because they know I'm there. Like I, for some reason they seem to like busting my chops or, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, I mean, you've seen the footage when handsome first, you know, when you first see him and the footage is like, almost like you can see only his skull. Cause like I was telling you when, before we were talking, the, the, their, their cloak seems to function like an MRI or a CAT scan, you know, it erases things, shows through things to hide the being that's inside that cloak. That's my personal theory on how it works. Okay. And uh, so it's more like almost like you're looking at his skull, but he's turned this way and then he turns forward. And I think that's when he sees the camera and his eyes pop. It's like, like, like that kind of thing, you know, and which shows you that these, these beings are intelligent and technologically advanced because he obviously knew that it was a trail camera, see, and then his expression changes into what I call in the documentary, the grimace shot, which is the one you said where he looked a little scary or whatever and all that. I'm not going to repeat what you said, because, you know, that's, um, uh, but uh, it, 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 the grimace shot is where he has this look on his face, like this, where he's like, like, ah, uh, like that. And that's to me, like when you do something at work and you just screwed up and you know you're in trouble, you know, you're like, he's like, like, oh, I'm going to get fired for this or I'm going to get written up or whatever it is in their, you know, world and organization, you know, that type of thing. And that's the really cool shot, though, there in the first documentary, because you can see a lot of the anatomy. You can see his brow ridge and the conical head and the very heavy cheekbones and the heavy jaw and some of the teeth, which are quite sharp, peeking through and the tubercles and those heavy scale like things on the brow ridge and some of the throat scales that I pointed out and all this stuff. Um, and then he uh, then he sort of pulls back and he pulls away from me and you see it go like the field starts to get sucked into itself. And that's when the temperature rose again because he wasn't as close. See, so. But anyway. Well, okay. So, where is this area located? And you said that it's known for for weird things happening. Bucks County, kind of Pennsylvania. The nearest town in that area would be Doylestown. And if somebody looks up Doyle, okay, we're Max is frozen up again here, so we'll just wait for him to come back, and I'll re ask him that question. But I you got to go to maxhawthorne.com, you know, and, and get this on the subscription. And I had a chance to view it earlier today before the show. And this is high strangeness. Imagine setting up a camera right at your door on your wall or something. And you could see like the picket fence on the outside. And there's like this white 
white stream. It's I don't want to say it looks like a tornado, you know, but I don't know really how else to describe it. It's like it's like this spinning cloud that is just going on and on and on. But it's what's inside this this white mist or this cloud or whatever you want to call it that really seems to to morph. I guess that would be the way to look at it. Uh, it morphs into uh, this being inside. And uh, the more he actually, and Max is pretty damn good at uh, at bringing out pictures, but the more he does this, the more we're learning that there is a, like a face to it. There's like a, a presence within that mist. And you were explaining Max uh, about where this, uh, this Bucks County, Pennsylvania is and the high strangeness in the area. Yeah. If anybody looks up like Bucks County cryptid or something like that, you're going to find all sorts of stuff. Um, there's one area called Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which has, if you look up dog man, let's say, or dog man in Bucks County, there have been dozens of sightings of these things. Okay. Um, some are eight or nine feet tall, according to reports. Families have seen them, like, you know, coming home from school and running across a, a country road, like, boom, 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 and then leaping into the trees and stuff. There are a lot of the sightings of that type of creature, okay? But, uh, you know, Handsome is not a, quote, dog man. He's uh, something else. Are you sure? I'm positive. I know exactly what he is. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? When we take a look at at everything that's kind of going on in this area. And you're saying the homeowner has mm -hmm. not had a lot of high strangeness happening. How did you know, or what was it their trail cam or camera that picked it up? Or no, what did mine. you pull one up? No, I, I have my own. I use uh, some pretty good model trail cameras and I modify them to prevent them from being easily seen by something, you know, that sees in the infrared spectrum, let's say. Because I've had incidents in the past where I've had foxes and, you know, like coyotes and deer even. Usually a predator sees it better. And they'll look right at the camera, like the infrared camera and stuff, like my older models and stuff. So I got better ones and then I modified them so they don't emit that in these infrared beams visibly. And it makes it easier to catch stuff on there, see? But, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, handsome is a reptilian. Um, a, a species called, they call themselves a Targ, T-A-R-G, short for Targisian, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And uh, he is uh, sizable, about eight feet tall. And I have uh, a, a track he left in the woods in that same area, actually. There were a bunch of tracks, but I got one that actually had like a print, you know, through the leaf litter and stuff. So, and his feet are sizable, the size of a Bigfoot's. Right. Uh, you know, Except I mean, they have claws. There are non retractable claws present. See, when I looked at this, mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and it's hard to describe for our audience because they, being on the radio, they can't visually see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But for me, when I looked at it, I saw about four or five different types of faces, including one that to me looked like a dog man. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. That's why I mentioned to you um, that the field and you know guys gals when you go on there like i suggest you get a subscription it's only 9.99 a month you get unlimited views and every video that comes out you're going to see and believe me dave is going to want me on here a lot because the next video is you know what a phantom cat is right they kill them abcs alien big cat that type of stuff so that's the next documentary that's coming okay and i've got footage of one from not even 20 feet away and it's going to freak people out but anyway um when you go on there you can actually look at the documentary look at the video and you can go frame by frame and look through it and my belief is that this cloak that handsome uses to conceal himself and stuff is also sort of a, like a portal and because of that you see things in that portal that you wouldn't normally see so you may well be seeing a dog man you may well see grays in there you may well see a mothman in there if you look carefully i have footage of a Mothman flying, infrared footage. And that's another documentary that's coming. Okay, so the Mothman is real. The Dogman is real. Grays are real. Okay? And your buddy here 
is going to be bringing these out one by one by one with all the footage and stuff and images I've collected. Infrared, thermal, even regular cameras sometimes, like I told you privately, you know, that stuff is very, very grainy when you have to like brighten up so much and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, so yeah, that, that you, you know, it's like a, that, that cloak is like a cornucopia. And I don't know if we're looking at, you know, like, maybe versions of that, like that it's used for disguise purposes. Maybe the entity conceals himself by appearing as those things. And this is like suits you have on a rack. You know what I mean? Is it that? Is it other beings that he's encountered? Is it other beings like that, that it's like the portal, like that he's coming through it and they're looking and they wish they could come through, but maybe they can't because he's like the gatekeeper or something like that. There's a lot of possibilities. You know, it's hard to say, but it is an intriguing thing to see, to watch, and to look at and see what you can see in there. You know, I mean, people like when you saw what you thought was a dog man, were you like, holy crap? Like, look at this. Well, what I looked at is I saw a skull. Mm -hmm. I saw what looked like a reptilian being. I saw what looked like a dog man. I looked, mm -hmm. saw something that looked like it was like a, a ghostly entity. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a. There was a number of things that I saw that just did not make sense mm -hmm. on that portion. And and that is what really kind of um, um, kind of just you? well, not just intrigues me, mm -hmm. okay, but but actually, uh, how can I put it? Actually makes me wonder about this um, about this um, this entity. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost like it's a shapeshifter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, he's not a, well, I mean, I, let's put it this way. It is possible that that cloak can be used in an illusory manner, you know, to alter appearance. Like I said, like if a being wants to. Talk and Max is timed out once again. We're having computer issues for some reason. You know, this never happens with Max. And then we get into this weird subject and his computer just keeps acting up and kind of booting him. And then, so we're going to have to reload. Not a problem. He will be right back. But I mean, this from looking at this video that he put out at maxhawthorne.com, okay, it literally looks like there is a shapeshifter that is going through this wind. And like I was just saying, saying it looks like there's a dog man slash werewolf type face. There looks to be a Sasquatch with the conical head uh, face in there. It seems to have a, a skull and, and a ghostly adventure. And I, I mean, I don't really see this as being alien like he does, but I do see it actually being something that that is odd and is very perplexing to what we are actually accomplishing. And I've never seen anything like that because the video is only like 30 seconds long. Okay. For you to watch it. And Max, we were just talking about, you know, this being a shapeshifter, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, kind of entity. Right. Do you think that it's maybe showing all of these different types of, of faces to show what it could do? Uh, like I said, it might be like, like suits on a rack, like different disguises that could be used. You know, I mean, anything's possible. Um, I had an incident where I was in a different house. I uh, encountered a, I, I, what I b believe finally was a, a reptilian of some kind. And I saw it on my thermal and everything, and I was talking to it. And I think it's adjusted its appearance to be less intimidating, to be less scary, you know? Um, like, uh, at first it adjusted its size to be like about my height. And I was like, well, oh, you're the same size as me. Like I always thought they'd be bigger, you know? And I was looking, I'm like, wait, are those teeth? You know, like this type of thing, like, like that kind of, yeah. And then its appearance changed. It started looking like the, uh, sort of like a gecko, you know, like, like a much milder appearance or something like that. And at one point it even started looking like uh, baby Groot or Gru, Gru, no, Groot, Groot, you know, like from the uh, MCU, you know, the tree, Guy, but the baby version it was very weird but uh and i take that as a way of trying to be polite like unintimidating and stuff you know which is a nice thing i mean you know we're human beings you know a, a reptoid that's eight feet tall you know could be quite scary 
for us. You know, we have that whole predator prey reaction and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, so, I mean, whether it's disguises or other beings, I don't know. But, uh, you know, if you see the dog man, did you notice like, uh, like the ones that I've seen images of, they have like, um, the muzzle isn't super thin, like a, a real dog. It's a little more meaty. You know what I mean? Like, like a little more, not bearish almost, but you know, it's not like slim, like you'd see like a coyote or some wolves and stuff like that. So anyway, but, uh, you know, who knows? It's intriguing, right? No, I, I totally think it's intriguing. You know, one thing that is shy on everything is the morphing of a body on this. We, we seem to only get headshots of it. Why do you think this is? Uh, because it was six feet from where I was standing. Six feet from where he was standing. This is so, so weird. Okay. I don't know how this is happening, you know, with this creature. I Can you call it a creature? Do you call it, do you call it something else? I really don't know. I really do not understand what this thing may be, which you can find at maxhawthorne.com. I highly encourage all of you to go check it on out. You know, these, you know what? I'm just going to say this, these personal mysteries that people are having and encounters people are having to me, they are so much more impressive than any kind of data or science that is being done on anything in this field. You still have to do that. You have to do the follow-up, try and figure out what it is. I get that. But when you have this kind of, kind of intervention with a creature or a being or an entity, it just makes your mouth water because you want more. You want it to happen. Now, Max, you were saying right before you got cut off there. That you again, were six, cut off again. <laughs> yeah, you were six feet away from this. Mm -hmm. but did not, I did not know he was there. No. And that tells you that these guys have like a, a code of conduct, let's say. I mean, you could tell from the footage first if you're dealing with an emotional being, by the way, his expressions, his reactions and stuff. Okay. But, uh, and I've got multiple like incidents with, you know, recordings of these guys in the beginning, I think they weren't pleased with me having this footage and we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. But, uh, you know, my point is, is that they have to have a code of conduct because, you know, I could have been killed multiple times, understand, but I wasn't harmed, which is very reassuring, you know, and when you see him eventually like in the, an upcoming documentary, you know, fully, you know, I don't want to say exposed and stuff like that, but fully scaled with the skin intact and everything like that. Yeah, he's a very noble, enigmatic looking being. I don't like to call him a creature. I, I think that's offensive. Okay. Just like, you know, if you or I were called a creature, we'd be like, you know, I'm not a creature, you know, like I'm an individual, this type of thing. But there must be some sort of code of conduct, behavior, et cetera, and stuff like that. Because even though he probably got in trouble for getting recorded, you know, nothing happened to me. Now, there was an incident like uh, the following day, a day or two later, where I, th I suspect he might have come back to that house intent on disabling the trail camera and stuff, and it didn't happen. Um, but something struck the side of the house and a hose reel that was out back was damaged. I don't know if that was him or it just could have been a deer that jumped on against the wall and smashed into it, et cetera. You know, so who knows? But the point is, is that, you know, I was not harmed and uh, thankfully and we're able to have this conversation. Well, you know what? I'm glad we're having this conversation too, because we're going to get more deep into it here in, in just a little bit. So we want to make sure that uh, you are right with us, Max, because there's more to this story than what we've just got into. You know, there's the close encounter. Why wasn't it seen by Max? Where was this happening? Why was this taking place? What was with the shape shifting? Is it reptilian? Is it not? MaxHawthorne.com, if you want to view this video on your own, you can head on over there. Spaced Out Radio. We're done one hour. We got another hour with Max. A busy night on the Mighty SOR. Stay tuned. This is Spaced Out Radio with hopes. 
Dave Scott. All right. There we go. There we go. All right, Dirty Filth, let's bring this over to you because that was a whiskey sighting, a false blob sighting. Yeah, a little gargoyle decided to show up. Mm. Well, I have to blow my nose one second. All right, hope make it a good one. You know, I swear in warehouses, they got a guy at the very end before they ship things out. He's just got like a bucket of dust and dirt and dumps it onto the... Oh, there's Blob. Oh, oh, we got a Blob sighting. We got a Blob sighting, everybody. There she is. There she is. We have a Blob alert. We have a Blob blob. alert. Oh, yeah. There she is. It's going to be snack time pretty quick here. All right, I'll put this back down here. But, uh, friend of mine gave me an idea for this. Oh, of course, this stupid arm is not going to work, is it? No, I got to get a new one of these. Just doesn't. Eh, there we go. Wait, wait. Bloody hell. I'll just go like that then. Well, I hope everybody's having a good night, had a good Easter. I did nothing for Easter. You can come back anytime you want, monkey face. All the cats are outside, and it's all like sloppy little cat paws all over the place because they're running around in the dirt. Except for Blob. She's just laying at the back steps. (laughs) Blob. Cat fuzz everywhere. I swear, when you have a cat, you can open a brand new package of cereal, and there's already going to be a cat hair inside of it. Thanks, Aloha, Dave. I appreciate the kind words. Look at this. Well, Christine, uh, I get worked up when I'm playing Tetris. That's about it. Other than that, I'm pretty, pretty chill. It's actually funny. I I go to the one grocery store by my house and they got a free arcade machine there. And I play this one game, 1942. And I noticed that somebody had the high score in there. And I go, who's this guy? Who does he think he's got the high score? So I smashed the crap out of the high score. And it turned out it was me. (laughs) It's funny. I think people even play in old arcades anymore. Oh, hold on. Yeah, I'll show you here. Blob again. There's Blob. That's why everybody comes here, apparently, to see the cat instead of listen to the show, mostly. You should probably just throw, like, pictures of cats there and talk about UFOs and ghosts and aliens. And I'm out of tea now. Also, this coming Sunday, I'll be on with Rob G on Sunday talking Oh, just artwork and such like that. I'm already sweating. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, lovely Julie. Well, the gargoyles returned. All the cats are anxiously awaiting cat snacks. Oddly enough, my cats aren't afraid of the vacuum. They just kind of lay in the way. Never get out of the way. It's just incredible. They're a special bunch, all four of them. Oh, my blob. Yeah. Well, it's just about snack time here. Okay. You know, for a small cat, blob weighs like 10,000 pounds. She's probably got a little bit of dark matter inside of her. Uh, Blob's Blob's pretty bad with hearing. She doesn't hear very well anymore. She's about like 10,000 years old, so. The missus had a Maine Coon. Uh, 
I, I never, unfortunately, didn't get to meet the Maine Coon. It was Whiskey's brother. And Whiskey's grumpy. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to get her to come sit on the show or anything. She just grumps about stuff, wants snacks and eat mice. The ferret. That's got to be a superhero name. All right. I am back. Hi, Dave. Good to have you here, Dirty Phil. Dude, you don't have to do that. All right, I'm going to administer cat snacks. It's very important, Dave. I gave my cat snacks earlier. I'll give Blob an extra one because she deserves it. Yeah, please do. From all of us. All right, good night, everybody. Good night, Dirty Filth. Good to have you here. All right, that's Dirty Filth, everybody, with another great cartoon for you. And big thank you to T-Bone Times 2 and W. Decker. We have a... A wonderful, wonderful show. Don't forget, you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We put new swag up. New swag. So go check it on out. Here we go with Hour 2. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate Burning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Halation. Halation is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our way, spa, our website, rather, is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Here we go. The man behind the Kronos Rising theories and series, sci fi books. Max Hawthorne is here. And we are talking about this strange experience that he has had at a friend's house in Pennsylvania with this mist like creature. But when you look inside the mist, there's some faces. That are there, Max? Welcome back, my friend. Good oh, to have you here. Thank you, brother. Here, I wanted to introduce you guys to Olaf first off, since you like cats. This is yeah, we one, like cats. This around. is one. This is one of our Siberian forest cats. You should do good boy. Good Holy boy. cow, that cat is huge. That's what she said. Yeah. Oh god. But anyway, yeah, that's Olaf, aka Gray Slayer, and. Uh, like I said, one day we'll talk about that. Why I give him that nickname. You no know, right, baby boy. You behave yourself, okay? So anyway, um, yes, I'm sorry. What were you saying? I got sidetracked by Fluffman here. Oh, that's all right. That's that's a good looking cat, by the way. Thank you. Good My wife cat. is allergic to cats, and Siberian forest cats tend to be hyperallergenic. So we had to get a couple of these behemoths, but they make good guard dogs or guard cats also. You know, and they're very uh, affectionate and playful. You can play fetch with them, all sorts of stuff. They open doors, they open everything. Uh, it's like you know, like children. Great stuff. So wonderful, wonderful. Hey, I want to ask you mm -hmm. in regards to this this creature, this entity that we are talking about here. By the way, somebody was asking where to see the video. I don't think they were the, on there, but Max I can't Hawthorne. in the chat. MaxHawthorne.com. You can sign up uh, for it to view it. It is a pay-per-view to see it on Max's website, but it's well worth it. Well worth it. And uh, it is uh, it is interesting. Why do you think it's a reptilian? Um, because first of all, I've seen, I have fully detailed images 
besides what was there. Like when you when you saw the video, the beginning, I added that intro part. Okay, this is a, a year ago, that more than a year ago that this happened. So since then, I've learned a lot more also. But, uh, you know, I was on the fence as I analyzed it there. I'm talking, could this be a Bigfoot, an interdimensional being, all sorts of stuff like that, you know. But having seen, you know, all of him, I 100% know what he is and there is more than one actually because the second one was as i mentioned was on video also i call him smiley okay because he actually approached the camera and i don't know if he was trying to test it out or if he was trying to be funny or what because he had this cloak going on which was different from the other one's cloak but he actually goes right up And we'll bring back Max here momentarily as he is having some computer troubles tonight that just keeps freezing up his computer. We tend to think that, you know, for the sake of the woo, that it is actually the phenomenon that is calling this. So he'll quickly log out, log back in here in a minute. But I can tell you, you know, I, I don't know if it's a reptilian. You know, there's apparently more to this that they have caught in. Or cotton? No, caught. Dave, English. Okay, that they've caught. And I haven't seen those videos yet. I, Max hasn't, I don't think, released them yet. He hasn't done his fine detail and research work on those just yet. And I'm curious to see them now. This has put me down a rabbit hole. I mean, how many times do you see a mist and actually zoom in on the mist? Now, me personally, I don't have the computer know-it-all or the or the knowledge to actually break down and, and change a photo around to see if there's anything um, in there. Okay. I don't have that talent. You know, I know how to speak in front of a microphone. I don't have that photo uh, enhancing talent, you know, but Boy. Max, I was just asking you, uh, going to ask you in regards to this creature mm -hmm. or, or entity, let's call it an entity. Uh, you know, you're talking, Okay, you'd like to call him handsome. <laughs> thing's ugly. I, I'm just going to say it right now. The thing you're is, only, I'm telling you, you're only saying that because he's missing his skin in the in in the image. Olaf, will you stop? Oh my God! So you got, missed all the crashing and banging when this behemoth started pushing stuff off my desk and stuff. Um, I have other images of him where he was looking at the camera. Okay, that are going to be in another documentary. OK, and where he cocks his head to the side and he's looking right at it like that and everything. And he has this look on his face. Uh, to me, it's like he's like, wait, Olaf, you're as bad as whoever's messing with the freaking the, the, the signal. Um, but uh, I, oh, my God. Um, sorry. It never ends. Child, I will. <laughs> Come here, you hairy Virginia man. Stop it. Okay. Here, play with the desk now. He was trying to open, pull this out of the of my desk and everything. So now I'm leaving it open so he can stick his head. If you get stuck in there, you're going to regret it. Um, sorry, but uh, it to me, it's like he was looking at the camera and going, does that even have batteries? Like, is that even working? You know, that type of thing. That's my impression. Okay. And I only found that image because I was like petting a cat and I was leaning this way you know, like this. And I looked at the camera, uh, I mean, the screen, and there it was, you know, because the tilt had thrown me off a bit and stuff. But uh, Smiley actually smirked right into the camera. Like, you know, big, a little intimidating smirk, okay? Especially when you don't know, like, what their intentions are, which I didn't back then and stuff. I was honestly, understandably, a little nervous, you know, having this type of attention. Uh, you know? Yeah. That is not paranormal activity. That is Max's cat knocking things down. That's what we are having. Max's cat knocking things down. Mm-hmm. You know? But this entity, I don't know how I would react to something like that. Because we get a lot of misty, misty days in the forest out here. We really do. And it's one of the weird times to go into the forest when it's misty like that, because you never know what's hiding just beyond your sighting. You know what I'm saying? You never know what's just hiding there, lurking, staring at you. And this was like six feet away, six feet away from him. 
All right, Max, go ahead. I I don't know what what you asked me because of the interference. Okay, but, you said you were six feet away from this thing. Oh yeah, so, that's an estimate, but that's probably pretty close. And, and you if didn't it matters, see- he is literally eight feet tall. No joke. Okay, you're what six six feet six, six one. one. Yeah. Okay, so that's a pretty good judge of character. And and the camera is at how high? About five feet up. Okay, and that and by the images, it's it's a pretty big head. Yes. See, one thing when 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 your computer was acting up, I said, you know, in the shape shifting, when I saw the video, I saw what looked to be a face of a dog man. I saw what looked to be a Bigfoot with a conical head. I saw a skull that looked very skeleton-like. I, I saw like the face of a ghost mm-hmm. and something else I couldn't figure out. There was no like alien gray or anything like that. I didn't even see anything that kind of looked like a reptilian outside of the, the weird rectangular uh, shapes on it, much like a crocodile has. Yeah, on the throat uh, scales there that you can see. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess when I look at this, you know, I, I'm trying to – even piece together in my own mind what mm-hmm. this is. Now, I know you think it's a reptilian shapeshifter or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. What makes you believe it's of alien descent rather than something more mystic? Um, well, first off, having been privy to images, like I told you, that show a lot, lot more. Okay. I mean, there's no, listen, you, you can just kind of have to trust me when I say he is a reptilian. He is a Targ, T A R G. Okay, not a draconian, a torg. Um, the uh, like, the, I'm sure he's of extraterrestrial origin because first off, he has super advanced technology. Remember, we're looking at something that can be invisible, six, seven feet from where I'm standing. I can't see anything. You know, I mean, the infrared would pick up the, you know, the the cloak to a point and stuff like that, but penetrating is still difficult. Thermal sometimes show up on, although you have to tweak the thermal to really pull it out and stuff like that. But uh, I've looked at, uh, you know, an a- anatomy wise, for example, and I suspect that his people have some dinosaur ancestry or dinosaur DNA, let's put it that way, because the scales that he has on his face and stuff like that are virtually identical to some of the mummified dinosaur scales that you see out there, including Tyrannosaurus rex. So they may actually have some T-Rex DNA in there. At the same time, you're talking about a, a being that has, you know, fingers and a thumb, a poseable thumb like we do. So how all that works together, I don't know, obviously. I'm just looking at images and then trying to put a scientific analysis to them. So... I'm waiting to get frozen again. See, I'm like afraid to yeah. keep talking and yeah. stuff. Like, no, no, just keep talking, my man. Just keep talking. How did you notice this? In terms of what notice, like the over the overall, like what made you check the camera that and and think that there was something strange going to be happening there? Well, I go through all the footage that was on the camera. You know, deer, deer, opossum, raccoon, blah, 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 blah. Looking for one of those flying fairy-like things and stuff like that. Um, but uh, when I got to that one, I was like, oh, yeah, that was the one from last night when I went out there like an idiot and froze and whatever and stuff. And that's when I was, like, looking at the field and whatnot. But I, I found the face, which was the grimace shot, in fact, almost by accident. I was, like, looking at him, like, why is this so weird? You know? I mean, if you look, you can sort of see it has that. You know, like cyclone like look to it you've seen it right yes so you, the, the field and so i'm like well that isn't normal but it wasn't until i started going clicking through it like a couple frames at a time click click start stop start stop start stop and then all of a sudden even though it was faint before i increased the contrast the face was there i'm like what the heck is this it's like something emerges from the mist you know and at first and i mentioned this in the documentary i thought it was a ghost I even told a guy I went to high school, I said, I got a ghost on video, dude. It's incredible. And he, you know, mocked me and whatever, you know, this type of stuff, you know. But uh, but then as I was looking, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a ghost. It's not a human ghost. You know, like that image you sent, you know, you showed me before the show. If that's a ghost, that's not a human ghost. You know, that thing has unusual appearance. But, you know, I could see like the teeth. 
you know, the sharp teeth and, and the shape of the, like the heavy cheekbones and the heavy jaw and all this other stuff like that. So that's when I started getting really into it. And then I started going through the whole footage, almost frame by frame by frame by frame, adjusting contrast to make things pop more and then pulling out the frames that were like uh, the juicy bits, let's call them, you know, the money shots, whatever you want to call it like that. And, uh, but that's, that's the story. You know, the whole video is not, you can't see, I'm sorry, the cat's out there destroying stuff again. But, um, you know, you, the whole video, a lot of it is just the, this energy field or plasma or whatever it is, and you can't see through it. But getting through it here and there, you get glimpses of what's inside there, see? And it's intriguing. And that's what kind of, like, put my made me put my writing on hold because this is much more fascinating to me than creating fiction because this is like science fiction come to life, you know? So... No, I, I totally see that. I I totally see everything that you are saying regarding that. And and I'm just really trying to to put my finger on what the hell it actually is. Right? I'm trying to figure out uh, you know, how do we how do we, you know, move forward with this? Now, why let me ask you this. Why did you put a trail cam camera on this house? Like I told you before, I was uh, trying to get one of those winged fairy things, like footage of it. Okay. So oh. there had been fairy activity in the property. I well, that was that. in, no, but that was in the same general area where my daughter and I saw that one that crash land, had crash landed in the street. That flying thing that I told you about that she said was a fairy, my daughter, back when she was seven. So since, you know, I didn't have footage of it, if I'd had a dash camera, I'd have been on the news everywhere because it was like hovering right in front of my headlights. You know, but I didn't have a dash cam at the time and whatever, you know, so since then I periodically would put out, you know, I would go through phases. I'd put out a trail cameras for whatever, a couple months, and then I'd catch COVID and stop, you know, and then six months later or when it warmed up a little, I'd try again and this type of stuff, you know, and since I'd gotten in that general area, I'd gotten a couple frames of one of these flying things or something very similar, you know, that I figured it was worth revisiting. Hence, you know, me being there. So. That makes sense. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense regarding it. Okay. So after you saw this and, and you made, and you started wondering, mm. had there been any alien or reptilian type activity in the area in your research that you know of? I'm not aware of um, activity in the area. Um, I know that, uh, when I got the first and the second footage and stuff of them, I think initially they were not happy with me having this, you know, stuff, let's say. And I think there was a bit of a campaign going on to try and scare me, you know, to make me like back off and, you know, not pursue it. Cause you know, I, I I'm sure that happens. Like one night, like they know where I live. Okay, you know, the, I'm easy to find for these guys, apparently, and stuff like that. So there have been a few incidents by... See, that's one thing that I have never had happen here. You know, out of all the time I've been doing this show, I've never had that knock on the door. I mean, I've had a couple of warnings... You know, email warnings, phone call warnings, stuff like that. But I've never had that knock on the door. I'm glad I haven't. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. But I've never had that. You know, that little tap on the window that says, hey, maybe maybe you shouldn't be talking about this stuff. You know, never had that happen. Kind of jealous, actually, now. You know, I mean, with all the woo that we talk about. You know, you'd think that there'd be somebody out there who's who's uh, wanting to knock on my door. Nope, nope. Just a boring old Canadian dude broadcasting this stuff, you know, bringing it to your attention. So, hey, it's just, this is mind-blowing, though. It really is a, a little bit mind-blowing towards it. All right, Max, you were saying that about... Uh, about you know have you been contacted about any of this contacted by who by any special type people no no 
and I prefer to keep it that way, to be frank. Um, but I was growled at once in bed, like literally roared at in my ear as I was like, you know, trying to sleep and stuff. And like I said, I think this was an early on attempt to like scare me off or whatever and all that, you know, but, uh, and I don't respond well to intruders or to being bothered in my sleep. And I literally just turned and told whoever, whatever it was to go blank their mother. Understand? Okay. And uh, I'm not kidding. I literally, I turned, I was like, you can fill in the blanks, okay? And it yep. was another incident way back then where I was walking through the house late at night, and we have a deck outside. And as I was walking, there's like four motion-activated lights out there. And as I was walking, they were turning on matching my speed, my progress, like blink, 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 as I was heading to the kitchen. And I'm like, that's nice. You know, did I have an urge to go outside? No. Okay. You know, but I think they like playing practical jokes. Let's put it that way. So who's they the phenomenon? No, these, these beings, you know, like, I think after a while they kind of realized I wasn't going to be scared off and stuff. And I think that, you know, they're, they don't disapprove of the work I'm doing. You know, I'm not trying to go out and create a panic. I'm not trying to scare people and like that. I believe these guys are just like, you know, observers more or less, you know, they may even have guardian abilities, meaning watching over people sometimes and stuff. That doesn't mean that there aren't bad reptilians out there because I'm sure there are. Okay. It just happens that I luckily haven't been exposed to that. So anyway, but, uh, I think they've, you know, kind of come to accept what I'm doing and I guess they're okay with it because they know I'm not going to quit and what, and you know, so uh, it is what it is, you know, and I keep you know, doing my thing and you know, gathering, going, traveling around and finding interesting stuff and, you know, collecting evidence and I'm putting the stuff together and doing my stuff. All right. As you are, are doing this now how many times now have you filmed this character um handsome has been on video once or twice and smiley on a separate one so two or three times altogether combining the two hmm so when when you look at um when you look at them, you know, have they come back since? Um, I had one, which I don't think was one of them, try to start to uh, appear. And I think it was an attempt to see if I would freak out, you know. And I did start to freak out, and then it just stopped, you know, like, like uh, let's see if I show myself a little bit. Is he going to freak out? Yeah, he's going to freak out, you know, this type of thing. So... You know, that's, uh, but have I seen them in the flesh face to face? If that's what you're asking? No. No, I, eh? oh yeah. my. But I have a lot of thermal images. What do you, what do you think they want? I think they're just observing, you know, keeping an eye on things. I think the fact that my daughter and I saw that one fairy and didn't respond negatively to it, maybe they find interesting, you know, I mean, even though you don't believe they're reptilians, I'm telling you they are. And like I said, in a, one of the documentaries coming up, I will prove that to everybody, including you. But um, I like to joke and think, well, you know, maybe they like my books. I mean, think about it. The Cronus Rising series is about prehistoric, you know, giant prehistoric marine reptiles alive in the present. Maybe they like my writing. Maybe they like the fact that six feet to my left, there's a, an original painting of a pliosaur with a girl in a bikini hugging it. You know, maybe they look and they say, oh, he, maybe he's one of us. You know, he's all right, this guy. You know, I, I like him. You know, who knows? I, I, I can't say. Maybe they just find me. Maybe they think I'm an interesting pet. I don't know. When you have these personal adventures like this, and we're going to get into this in the next half hour. If it I don't really get thrown off 16 times. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Yeah. But, I mean, it really changes the dynamic of just an investigation, mm -hmm. you know, because it's now personal and I'm sure that's how you're taking it. And we're going to get into that next with Max Hawthorne. You can view his video at maxhawthorne.com. spaced out radio continues right after this. Everybody stay tuned. <laughs> Listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott.
Uh, all right, we are clear. When Max comes back, tell him to blink two times if he needs help. How's that going to work with my sunglasses on? <laughs> I don't know. I know. Wait, I'm blinking. Did you see it? <laughs> of course. We can see right through them. Human Carl, nice to see you show up, buddy. Oh, my gosh. Hope you're feeling better. You know, you had in your starred thing somebody asking if I telepathically communicate with these guys and stuff. Yeah. I'm not a, when somebody has a, a, a Facebook user account with no picture, you know, right away I'm like, mm. no, it, what happened? It's a stream yard thing. Is it? So, uh, yeah. Who, who asked that question? Hold on. It just I says can... Facebook user. Yeah. On your end, I, I go to the Facebook chat and it'll be up here somewhere. See, uh, I it's have from, from Ozzy Ange. Oh, it's from Ozzy Ange. Actually, Ange. occasionally they do say things like telepathically communicate with you yeah and often it's uh, sometimes it's being chastising and sometimes it's being obnoxious but funny okay and all that and you know that's why i i, I don't have problems with them honestly i i find them to be uh cool you know so yeah, but uh, you know, I, I need to be clear. This has nothing to do with my house. I don't want weirdos showing up on my doorstep or freaking, you know, tramping on the lawn. I have to call the cops or whatever and stuff like that. And I make it a point to not want this type of activity in my house. I did have a great problem. And I kid you not. Okay. Um, How'd you get rid of? The, well, say you're, you're you're giving a lot of juice here. You know, yeah, well, uh, I'm not talking about it in front of your people because you know all that. But I had, you know, those, I don't like those mother. Fuckers at all. Okay, they are assholes. They are cock the cockroaches of the cosmos. How do you, okay? how do you really how do you really feel? Uh, I'm I'm sugarcoating it. Okay, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't like being jumped in my bed. Okay, and, yep. and I call Olaf Grayslayer for a reason. Okay, mm. understand? Got so, you. Got and you. that will be an eventual episode. And I have thermal images of them. And so, and they are ugly little bastards. Okay, motherfuckers. <laughs> All right. I fucking hate grays. Ever touch me, bastards? Oh yeah, who doesn't have a little bit of grays in their life? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think because of you know me trying to communicate with these guys and stuff like that. You know, they oh oh let's let's kidnap him and and probe him, take his DNA. You know, whatever. No. Only don't play that. Fucking touch me. <laughs> you think it's funny, okay? But let me tell you something, okay? It's quite, <laughs> fright it's quite frightening. Dude, you don't even know my experiences, man. No, I don't, okay? So when, when we get to that point, then we'll be talking about it, okay? But oh, my dude. cat, Olaf slashed one of them right in the face, right in the eye. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, and he had like a bunch of them. When I told you I had a cell phone picture and there were eight grays in it, what I didn't mm -hmm. tell you is he had them cornered. Understand? Mm -hmm. They're afraid of the cat. I have seen, I have seen five different species of gray. Yep. There's a lot. And, of them. and uh, I've had the good, the bad, and the ugly. Have you seen one that's about man size with a really big head? You mean uh, human Carl or alien Carl? I don't know, but I've got a thermal one, and its head is ginormous, and it's almost two meters tall. So what do you mean? You mean like that? No, no. Although that's cute. Is that an actual photo? No, that's a rendering. But that oh. that looks like. Uh, the guy who was outside my window watching me, um, watching me do my show back on April twentieth, twenty fifteen. Actually, we're coming up to the anniversary of that here pretty soon. Mm. Well, if I have my great attempted kidnapping episode ready by then, you know, then that that will be cool. But yeah, but this that one didn't seem to be like one of the uh, hostile ones. I think he's more like. 
Like these reptilians, like an observer, mm -hmm. curious, that type of thing. His oh, head yeah. is huge, much bigger the, than that. I don't know how he walks. The one I will get revenge on, hi, Ginger Turtle, how you doing, is he's kind of got his neck sticks out from his body, and then his head is on the end of the neck. He was only about three and a half feet tall, four feet tall. I'll get him back, the bastard. Uh, thank you, Debster, Debster T-Bone Times 2, and W. Decker for the super chats. Hi, Nicole, in the chat room. And here we go, everybody. In like seven seconds. I always screw this up. No worries. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go with the second half of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can always check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. And on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Final half hour with Max Hawthorne tonight. We are getting into strange creatures that seem to be hanging out with him. Max, <laughs> you got some you know, weird stuff happening, my man. Weird. I would stuff. love, love to have some of those guys just come over, hang at the house, have a few beers, play cards, whatever. Okay. And you know what's funny is like during the breaks, Max's line is so clear, so clear. You know, you know what I was thinking during the break. This is going to be the 10-year anniversary on the 10th of the UFO landing that I witnessed. And then on the 15th of me meeting Samantha Mowat, walking into the forest and seeing the beings. Oh, 10 years. Cannot believe that. Where did 10 years go? Man, I remember that moment where I was like 40 years old. And I'm staring at this 10 to 12 foot extraterrestrial about 200 feet away from us. And just thinking, how is this real? How is this moment real? Changed my entire paradigm. My entire outlook on life was just shifted. I still don't know why it happened, how it happened. But man. That five-day stretch was quite intimidating. Max, welcome back. Uh, I know it's frustrating, but we're having a heck of a show here. You know, okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. You were you asked me something, and then I got, like, thrown out again. So Yeah, oh. I forget what I asked because I was covering your butt there on the air. But that's all right. That's all right. Um, I want to, I want to ask you in regards to alien contact and this potentially being alien, is this new for you? Uh, relatively. I mean, when I was around 24, I saw a UFO, um, from a distance, um, in Philadelphia, Southwest Philly, uh, screaming across the sky. What, uh, and at first I, I didn't like, I thought it was a jet fighter. Because you could see, like, there's the airport, Philly Airport is near there, and there were all these, uh, you know, jump. It's like they're going to shut us down even more. It's so weird. Weird. So, anyways, getting back until Max comes back here. And let's remember that question. Has he had uh, contact before? Try and butter him up for this. But I got to tell you, going back 10 years ago where my whole paradigm shifted, I did still to this day want to know why. I do. I, that's one of my mysteries. 
we all have our own little mysteries in life that we want to be able to understand a little bit more. That is my mystery. I mean, I like what, what's, uh, what's been happening. I do. I like the woo. I like all the stuff that seems to be going on. Doesn't happen often as much anymore, but back then when I, when, before I had the show, when I was concentrating it on, on all of it, like every day, man, the interaction was incredible. Especially if you're around people who are connected, you know? All right, Max. Uh, just to be clear, I expect to be paid for the entire two hours and not, you know, penalized for the times that I was thrown out. <laughs> okay, just making sure we got that out there. So anyway. we, got it. we got it out there. <laughs> You've seen UFOs? No, I saw a UFO. Um, in, in Philly in the sky. And the only reason I know it was a UFO was that I was watching this one bright white uh, white light above all the planes. And it was screaming across the sky like three times as fast at least. And I thought it was a jet fighter. So, you know, you're a young guy. It's nighttime. You're like, oh, wow, that must be a jet fighter. I'd never seen one flying before. And I watched it traveling across the sky, you know, from left to right, we'll call it. And then all of a sudden it just went like, you know, if you're going 1,500, 2,000 miles an hour, it just went, and then it just reversed direction. No turn, no deceleration, nothing. Like just bouncing off a wall and going back. And obviously, we don't have that technology, you know. So, and I remember being on another show, and this guy from uh, one of the that big UFO organization, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, he's like kind of runs it. And he was on this show, and they had me tell the story. And he said, if normally I would have said you were full of it, he goes, but I saw like two months later the same exact thing. He saw something that he thought was a satellite falling out of the sky, and then it just reversed direction, went right back. No deceleration, you know, no turn, whatever. So, anyway, but you know, that's the own prior to that's the only thing. I mean, I saw something in the cemetery, you know, when I was nineteen, which is in Monsters and Marine Mysteries, which was terrifying. But that wasn't a UFO. Seeing something coming out of the ground in a cemetery is not extraterrestrial. It's just horror. Understand? So, and I never went back. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't like cemeteries. I really don't. Max Not a fan one. Do they give you anything in return for the... <laughs> I hope she's asking you that and not me. Uh, no. We, you know, our audience likes a good anal probe story every now and again. So what can I say? Yeah. No, there was no probing here. Okay. I, I, I personally feel like a, a, a Targ would find that a little undignified to have to do something like that, you know? So, anyway. Oh, I get you. I totally get you. Max, I mean, how far do you want to take this? This is your own mystery. Mm -hmm. This is your own little suspense film that you're creating. It's, mm -hmm. it's so different than what you are used to mm -hmm. doing. How far are you going to take this? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, um, like it's well, not it's like a, like like how far am I going to take it uh, in terms of what? In, in in regards to the investigation. Well, I'm I'm just doing a series of documentaries, um, honestly, for people, and uh, I put I set them up on a an inexpensive pay per view site because I'm not going to give YouTube my work and let them make millions of dollars and pay me twenty cents. Honestly, who would? You know, so, but uh, I want to share the knowledge with everybody. And uh, since my writing is on hold, obviously, I want to make a little living while doing it. But uh, I've been collecting a lot of information and I have enough to make a lot of documentaries on assorted things, assorted phenomena that people want to know about. You know, like I said, the next one video that's going to be on the site soon is about phantom cats. You know, those big black panthers that people keep seeing and stuff. So yes. I have I have footage of one from 20 feet away and it's very compelling and it is not a cat. Okay. It may start off looking like a cat, but it is not a cat and you'll see in the video. So quite intriguing and a little scary that one. Okay. Um, but you know, I have a, I'm doing a, a probably two follow-ups on the reptilian stuff. I'm going to do a Mothman one and then Lord knows what, you know, other, information I've collected that that'll be after that. So 
everybody that's subscribing to the site is going to have the opportunity to see some never before seen stuff. And this is actual evidence. You know, it's not like one of those shows you go on where somebody says, oh, this is a, a you know, a, a dog man carrying a, a person over its shoulder and you see a black blob. And that's like supposed to be your photo. And then you take this black blob and what is it? There's nothing there. You can't, you know, you brighten it, you do this, whatever. It's, it's just nothing. You know what I mean? No offense if anybody does sees it or anything like that. But, um, you know, everything I show is legit. It's out there. It, there's no hoaxing. There's no CGI. This is what it is. Okay. And, you know, you, uh, we analyze it as best we can and then see like, like you did when you looked at the thing, you know, you saw that and you were like, I see faces in there. You know, and there are, you know, I think, um, who was it? Barbara DeLong was the first person who noticed it beside me. I wasn't going to say anything because whether it's right. a porter or not, I was on the fence about. But she was like, you know, there are other beings in there and stuff. And I was like, yes, I know. You know, but the question is, what are they? See, are they disguises? Are they versions of the being that it is assumed? Are they places it's been and beings that it's seen? You know what I mean? Or are, is that a portal and that other beings would like to come through that portal, but they're not allowed to? Maybe that being is a gatekeeper. I mean, it could be anything, you know, but it's fascinating stuff. So hopefully, you know, I'll get more footage of them down the road, get to see them at some point, whatever. Oh, I hear you. I hope you do, too. Yes. I really, I really do. I mean, because it makes the story a lot more interesting when it's happening to you in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of, 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 um, seeing that happen. Okay. Like even with my own experiences, like mm -hmm. everything, everything for me really started 10 years ago this month. Mm -hmm. hard, hard to believe it's a decade on April 10th. I had a, I witnessed a UFO on the ground. Mm -hmm. Wow! I was nice. called outside to see this this UFO, mm -hmm. and five days later, I I actually walked into a forest with a young lady named Samantha Mowat, and I actually her and I actually saw a Ted twelve foot being. What kind of being? We believe it was Arcturian. Was it like what color was its skin? It was tan skin. Tan skin. Mm -hmm. you and know, I, I'm sorry. And then it uh, it got uh, it started off very uh, light colored, and mm -hmm. then it got it got darker as it stood there. Nice. So it was, very, it was very interesting. Yeah, that'll put some uh, hair on your chest. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That'll oh, put yeah. some cream in your coffee, so to speak. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was quite an intense, uh, an intense uh, situation. That's for sure. I have uh, started. I've shared on my uh, Monsters and Marine Mysteries group on Facebook. I periodically post thermals, thermal images, you know, for people. Um, and the first one, there was one that was in my house. Um, months and months ago where my cat, one of the cats was kind of standing guard at the bedroom door and it was a narrow gap there. And, uh, I filmed it because, you know, he was lying, sitting there. He first he meowed and he was sitting there like this and his tail was lashing. And you know, when a cat's pissed about something or whatever and all that, and he had put himself right in that space to block it, you know, and if you're a smart person, you don't go, you know, a 20 pound cat is not something that you want to shove your face in, you know, like when it's angry or whatever. But when I got the film, and I looked at it and I had one of my people analyze it. It looked like there was something there. And we found that there was some sort of head, like kind of looking at the cat. It almost looked like Freddy Krueger, like a burned being or something like that, you know? So I shared an image of that and people mock you or say it's pareidolia and whatever. And I don't really care. Okay. Um, but, uh, and then it was. Yeah. The mocking that goes along with it is a little incredulous at times. It really is because, you know, it's funny. A lot of people try to make make fun of you regarding what you've seen and what you heard because you just want to have the discussion. You just want to 
uh, have the conversation to see if anybody else has noticed that. But it's an uncomfortable conversation that many experiencers have because they just don't know what the reaction is going to be, whether people will say, are you, are you on drugs? Were you drinking? Were you having a psychotic episode, a mental meltdown? These are all things that we go through. And it's very tough to accept that when you are trying to, to just understand this incredible experience that you have had, right? That is, uh, that is the, the real, real tough part of it. And I feel sorry for people like that. I feel sorry for people who who have to try and explain themselves to those people about what they've had. They just had an incredible encounter. Max has had them. I've had them. And people just want to know what is going on with them. You know, we're talking about encounters. I mean, how mm-hmm. people, you know, look at experiencers, Max, and they and they sit there and say, you know, this is, this is uh, tormenting. This is awful. This isn't very fun. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to make sure when I post these things that, you know, I don't get defensive because I tend to, or because I know a lot more than I'm showing. Like, in other words, if I, I, I just the other day, and like I said, it's in that group on Facebook, Monsters and Marine Mysteries. I'm not trying to get people to enroll. They can just go there. It's a public group and see it. But I took a picture at a house on a stairwell and there was a face there in the thermal and it looks very human although a little rugged looking and everything. And a friend of mine said that was a Pleiadian, some sort of like humanoid uh, being, I guess, or whatever and stuff. So I shared it on there. And uh, yeah, if you hold it, you know, you don't want to get close to it. You got to hold it at arm's length in your phone. It jumps right out at you, you know? So very human-ish looking and stuff. So. Oh, I get that. I totally get that. You know, I mean, it's still intimidating for a lot of people to even have this conversation mm-hmm. outside of uh, outside of anything else. Max, I got a couple questions for you, sure. if you don't mind. Two from Ozzy Ange here. Sure. Uh, one of them is, uh, do you have telepathic communication or knowing when these beings are around? Um, my experiences have taught me that if you feel like cold coming o- over you for no reason, like a wave of it, usually something is approaching you. Um, I think that's part and parcel to this sort of interdimensional cloaking, whatever type of thing that goes on and stuff. Um, I have been spoken to a few times by them telepathically, and I suck at communicating that way because there seems to be something wrong with my stupid brain um, and all that. But uh, more like I've been chastised a few times like that type of thing, you know, like I, I had made a request one time, which was probably out of line and I got a resounding no, you know, like that twice or whatever and stuff. And, uh, another time I was told I was talking about stuff, and it was like, like cease this nonsense or cease this, you know, and they call me by my first name. Um, sometimes it's, uh, once in a while, it's something amusing, you know, it, but it's not a common thing. I think it takes a lot of effort to, for somebody, for them to, you know, put that out there I could be wrong or maybe it's just a lot of effort to get through to me because like I said there's you know something damaged up there see when I was in second grade these nuns used to beat the crap out of me in Catholic school and they used to like take my head and crack it against the the back of it against a concrete wall repeatedly while smacking me in the face and screaming at me because I didn't do my homework for a month straight you know so maybe it messed up something back there I don't know it got the aliens in with you that's what it did maybe got you some aliens <laughs> When in doubt, alien it out, my man. That's right. You know, Every that's time we're it, talking here, I, I, I'm waiting for the next, like, you know, internet interruption and stuff. Don't you find that odd? I do find it odd today. I'm not going to lie. And We've never had me. that issue with you. Yeah. I, I've I mean, never like, had that issue with you. I've had, like, podcasts I've gone on about the new website and stuff. And two of them, the first two, the entire time I was on the show, the site had crashed. And stayed crashed for about 15 minutes after the show. So it's almost as if they were like, okay, we don't want anybody to subscribe to the site and see this video. So let's like crash his site for the entire time, plus a little. And this is where people will just give up. 
that I mean, that's my paranoid version of it and everything. But it, for it to happen multiple times seems a bit of a coincidence, you know. And then the power outage for another big video that shut it all down and stuff. I mean, it's like, and this, you know, it's like a, an ongoing thing. Mm hmm. So where do you go with here from here with your investigation? Well, I'm already, like I said, that Phantom Cat video is already being worked on. Um, and that's going to be crazy. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the next one that's going to come out on the site, episode two. And then I'm probably going to do a follow up with the uh, reptilian one where I'm going to produce more evidence. Then I'm going to do another one probably where Smiley showed up and compare him to the other one. See if they're the same species. Maybe there's a gender difference between them, male, female, that type of stuff, etc. Um, and then we'll see. I'll probably do a Mothman one next, and then maybe one on Greys after that, and who knows what. You know, I have a lot of pretty cool stuff, though. You know. Excuse me. No Let's problem. go to uh, Dizzy here. Do you think these could be conjured characters or thought forms you've created? Me. How would I conjured character? What is a conjured character? Where it's almost like a telpo that your mind has maybe had a thought form on these, and and all of a sudden, so I'm like my mind is somehow creating these beings on film. It happens. Really, I got one hell of a brain then, but uh, you know I've got images of some weird stuff. I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I don't think so, especially since some of it's happened when I'm not even there. So, oh wow! What's what's a thought form? Is that the same thing? Like a like a tulpa. What? A what? A tulpa. You have to learn the terminology, man. Um, this is new for me. What's a topa? A tulpa, T U L P A, tulpa. is thought forms that you put energy into, and and eventually the creatures become real. Ah. Yeah, like like Slender Man is a tulpa. Um, there's a really cool experiment in the seventies done out of uh, Toronto, Ontario called the mm -hmm. Philip project where mm -hmm. they, they created this, um, they created this, this character named Philip. They gave him a name and age, how, what he looked like, how he died. And the more energy they put into him, mm -hmm. they actually started getting paranormal activity from him. I see. I think that's more like you're inviting something to you and everything. But uh, I'm pretty sure like my imagination didn't create that that portal that you saw and everything else like that. Number one. And number two, I have physical evidence of handsome, including, like I said, a track with cl the claw mark span is about that big while he was hunting deer in that area. So and evidence of the deer running for their lives too. So unless I was able to magically with my mind powers create an enormous clawed track and series of tracks in the woods and stuff like that, while I was mind, using my mind powers, I, I'm sorry if I sound sarcastic, to make deer run from some invisible thing, et cetera, I'm pretty sure there's something there, you know? So. Oh, I would say so. We have about one minute to go tonight, and even with all the interruptions, it was so nice to have you back, Max, talking about this, you know, is, uh, is it's everything that we love to do here. And you are always so awesome for us. Thank you for being here. Brother, it was my pleasure. I always love being on the show. You got a great audience, nice people and everything. If I was a little defensive on that last answer, because it's so foreign to me, even the thought, I apologize, but, uh, I will look forward to coming back and I'll let you know when the next episode's ready. And, uh, you know, those photos that, you know, you sent me, I'll see what I can do for you on those as well. Oh, I appreciate that. And you know what? I want to keep updated on this because it sounds like a lot of fun. And people can go subscribe to your on your website to watch this at maxhawthorne.com, which we do appreciate. We encourage our listeners to do that as well. Max, always a pleasure to have you here. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio as we prepare for hour number three, Steve Stockton from Among the Missing. Then UFO Court with Courtney Marcashani. She will be back giving us an update as she is on assignment on the East Coast. It's been a very, very busy weekend for Courtney. So we will be right back. Stay tuned, everybody. Spaced Out Radio continues after this. You're 
listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. All right, Max, thank you very much, buddy. You are most welcome. I am going to go upstairs and collapse with the cat now. All right, buddy. You have a good night. We'll talk to you very soon, my brother. Later. Bye. Max Hawthorne, everybody. All right. Hi, uh, Jenny girl. Good to see you come back to the woo side of everything. Hope you're going to make it to Reno with us, my dear. We'd love to see you there. And uh, everybody, just wait around. I'll be right back. Stay tuned.
All right, old Davies back. Got about 45 seconds. Good to see you coming to Reno, Gen A. Yes, thank you to CS, uh, Deidre, W. Decker, T Bone with a hat trick, and Deborah Reno for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support, everybody. And sweet Tony D, good evening to you. Did not see the SpaceX launch. Oob to Joe's main. You've got aliens. I actually do have a sore right shoulder, Joe. Weird that you would say that. All right, everybody. Here we go. All right, here we go with the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Halation. Halation is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. It's that time of the night where we say hello to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing and another spooky story. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. went missing Mount Everest in 1924. Two British mountaineers, George Lee Mallory and Andrew Sandy Irvine, disappeared while trying to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Mallory was an accomplished rock climber who had demonstrated his abilities as a high-altitude climber on previous expeditions to Everest in 1921 and 1922. On the other hand, Irvine lacked experience in Himalayan and high-altitude climbing, but was skilled at repairing the oxygen equipment used by the British climbers at high elevations. Mallory made two unsuccessful attempts to climb above 28,125 feet without extra oxygen, but during his third expedition, he understood their benefits. Irvine's skills in repairing equipment and his lightweight oxygen system played a vital role. Regrettably, their oxygen tanks proved to be unreliable, with a total of 38 leaks occurring that year. On June 6, 1924, Mallory and Irvine began their climb from the top of North Call at 23,100 feet after having 10 sardines for breakfast. Their objective was to reach the summit within three days, and they borrowed a camera from Howard Somerville. Noel O'Dell, a geologist, spotted Mallory and Irvine climbing the second step of the mountain skyline on June 8. Despite being at a lower altitude than anticipated, Odell was confident that they would reach the summit. However, a snow squall hit the upper slopes, and upon reaching the high camp, Odell discovered fragments of oxygen equipment in Mallory and Irvine's tent. Irvine was getting their oxygen canisters ready before embarking on their summit attempt. Regrettably, Odell never laid eyes on them again. Odell spent the entire night searching for any signs of life above him when he returned to the North Call. Unfortunately, he did not find any. It took him two days to climb back to Mallory and Irvine's last camp, but he had little hope of finding his fellow climbers. No one had returned to the tent, which forced the expedition to accept that Mallory and Irvine were gone forever. The summit was thought to be close at hand before news of their tragic end was revealed. They had set out from Camp 6, situated at a height of 26,700 feet, 
and were steadily making their way towards their goal. With their expertise, it was expected that they would exceed the previous record of 28,000 feet. Dr. Theodore Howard Somerville, who personally achieved an altitude of 28,000 feet on Mount Everest, stated that the air is very thin at 27,000 feet. To move even one step forward, one must take 10 deep breaths due to the lack of oxygen. Dr. Somerville explained that the fatigue experienced when taking a single step is similar to that of running a 100-yard dash at top speed at sea level. After Mallory and Irvine's failed expedition, there were doubts about the possibility of humans reaching the peak of Everest. Nevertheless, others persisted, knowing it was impossible to survive on the summit without artificial air. During the 1930s, emergency flares and a functioning torch were found at Mallory's campsite. It's possible that Mallory forgot these items, which could have been used to signal his companions for help later on. In 1999, Eric Simonson led an expedition that discovered Mallory's body at a height of 8,155 meters. However, Irvine's body and Somerville's camera, which Mallory had borrowed, are still missing somewhere on the slopes of Everest. Mark Sinnott, the author who participated in a 2019 expedition led by Jamie McGinnis from New Zealand to uncover the mystery, discloses in his book, The Third Pole, that the Chinese might have discovered the remains of Irving and the camera and then concealed the evidence. And thank you to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for another spooky story as we continue on with the show. And of course, you could always find more stories just like that by going to youtube.com forward slash among the missing. Hit subscribe, ring that bell. You can hear them all there for free. We're just waiting on Courtney Marcassani to show up for UFO court as I think she's having some technical issues. She's on assignment in the East Coast. So when we get to her, we'll hopefully be able to uh, get in the UFO court. But right now, I kind of want to tell you guys some stories because 10 years ago this month, my entire life changed. I'd been seeing some weird, strange stuff leading up to this, but this month is going to be very, very special because it is the time when I look back on the calendar and literally say, I've got aliens. Yep. I've got aliens. It happened, started on April twenty or April 10th, 2014. Wow. It's kind of overwhelming to think. I've told this story so many times over the years, but it just rocks me now thinking, man, it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago. And there's like nothing I can do about it. And it's amazing when you have an experience, how it changes you and your perspective on everything. Because literally, my entire life changed that week. That week, my life changed. So here's the story of it all. Back on April 10th, 2014, we were at a friend's house who... Not really friends with them anymore, unfortunately. But what happened there was I was meeting my partner there after work. I'd worked till like eight o'clock at night. And it was so, so intense because when I was driving there and I worked about 30 miles out of town, but while I was driving to the farm, I remember getting this massive migraine headache to the point where I was having troubles driving because the bright lights of the headlights coming at me were so bright and that light was going right in and it was just set making my headache worse and worse and worse. And from there, I literally ended up getting to the house and I sat down and I stated I don't know how long I'm going to be able to be here. And when my partner asked why, I said, well, I've got this migraine. I'm absolutely dying. And she goes, do you want to go home now? I said, no, just got here. I'm going to go for tea. 
So after I sat down on the couch, kind of closed my eyes and put a pillow over my eyes just so I could absolutely try and take the pressure off. About 45 minutes later, the pain started subsiding. And then I realized that it was actually shapes starting to pulsate in my head. And immediately I had this feeling that I had to go in their back field. <clears throat> now that night was a was a it was a misty, misty night, you know, where it wasn't raining, but the clouds were really low and the mist going in there was just soaking through your clothes and your skin and everything. But I went outside anyways with the lady of the house. And we were just kind of standing back there and she goes, well, they called you out. Just tell me what you, what ha call them. I said, how? She goes, well, just ask for them. So I said, cause I'm a pretty r spiritual guy. I said, you called us outside out of peace, love and light. Can you please show us where you are? And about 150 yards away from us by the forest, the entire forest lit up. And it did that three times. I saw this giant blue cylinder that was standing vertically, probably 20 to 30 feet high. There was white light emanating from the bottom of it, pushing right through the trees. And then it disappeared after the third time and it never came back. Boy, did I, didn't I know that that was going to be the life changer. All right, let's do it. Courtney Marcusani is here for UFO Court. Let's get her in. That is an interplanetary flying space saucer. You have made me very angry. Very angry indeed. All right, Courtney Marcusani for UFO Court. She's on assignment out on the East Coast. We don't know what underground hidden hotel room she is in right now <laughs> glad she is here welcome back courtney hey dave hey, you're having me back i was getting scared i thought maybe the aliens kidnapped you oh no i'm just you know i'm on um remote so i have to use my phone so i have to use my phone as a mobile cell unit like a mobile cell yeah. tower so it took right. me a few minutes to get on tonight but i'm here thanks for waiting for me well i have to say our radio audience can't see this but your hair looks incredible today nice and curly. <laughs> thanks it's taken me like let's see it took me about five days to get to the east coast from the west driving being conservative and i just was able to get a nice shower and get all cleaned up tonight so i didn't look <laughs> haggard haggard well before we get into the news of the day because there is a lot of news out there what brought you to the east coast on assignment um, well, I mean, I, I had to come because I had family stuff to do, but of course, whenever I have to come to the East coast, I always try to lump in, um, UFO work on the side. So I was on, on my way, actually, I was able to meet with a friend of ours and watch some vintage footage. <laughs> so that was my first stop. I was able to stop in the Midwest and see some really important videos of, folks that are high up in the ufo um, world and on ufo issues but i plan to to visit when i'm here on the east coast a couple of a couple of high level sources you know in the ufo topic i can't say their names but that's part of my plan before i head back to the west oh have you had any of those intimate conversations yet yeah i have touched base with folks and planned meetings so those are definitely going to happen before i head back to montana before I go back to the West. Well, let, let's start things off here with Mr. Lou Elizondo, because many people thought being April Fool's Day that he would have uh, maybe played a, an April Fool on the public, but no, his website gets updated with a new launch. What's your thought on this? Well, I actually... Um... I don't know if this was chance or what, but I actually went to his website um, when I was still en route and I was checking on some things and I saw that he had a website. It's interesting because now it's 
come into Twitter and people are, you know, documenting it because of his updates about his media, his media platform that's coming. And so he's, uh, he's got a website. You can, you can subscribe, you can put your contact information in. And I was just watching, um, before I came on, you know, Thomas Fessler, he had, uh, done some commentary on it. And he was talking about the fact that lose contact page when you subscribe to it you get information back and the contact page is in the uk so there was some speculation that his publisher might be related to that and that they might be in the uk and so they did a little they did a little google earthing to try to see if it was you know a publishing house that was in the uk address but they didn't go on the record about that so i don't i still don't know about that about the book or his media about his media um, projects, like the documentary coming out, but the website is definitely up. Well, it's going to be interesting because Elizondo has been pretty quiet the last year and a half or so. And I got to tell you, this is something that has concerned a lot of people. It's also very uh, questionable of why he seems to be doing everything out of Great Britain rather than you know, back home on American soil. Do you find that interesting? I mean, I think that, you know, things change. Things are always in flux. I don't still know that his, you know, book publisher is in the UK. I mean, I think it warrants following up on. I think we might hear some information about that. Um, it was initially, I know for, everybody probably knows this, but it was initially announced that it was going to be Harper Collins. That was who the publisher was when he came out, I think in 2021. So that's still out there. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to think about what, what to think about that. If, if it's in the UK, if that matters or if it's important or not, it's still a question that's lingering. See, I'm not sure about that either. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter really how he gets the message out as long as he does get his message out. But there are a bunch of people out in the UFO world who are wondering, you know, why not keep it stateside? You know, a lot of his contacts seem to be over there. A lot of his supporters seem to be over there, like uh, the Liberation Times, Christopher Sharp and Vinnie Adams and many others. Uh, you know, so there is a good support network there for him. You know, uh, just I'm wondering... Why, you know, and I know it's it's tough to speculate. It really is. But I'm often wondering why uh, go with that rather than, rather than, you know, is he not getting the support here at home that he felt he would? That's what I kind of find interesting. I don't know. When I was on my way here, I, you know, I got to stop at our mutual friend's house and see video that was taken that included um, a bunch of people in the community. And Lou was on this video as well. And he was talking about his plan. So the video was taken in 2022. The video okay. was in 2022. And there was like a panel of people on it. It was a private video. I felt like Linda Moulton Howell being given the documents. You know, you can only <laughs> read, you know, these three pages and you can't have a copy. And so I saw the video and in it, he was detailing his whole plan, you know, his whole plan for disclosure, essentially, and specifically talking about um, San Marino and this Congress that they were going to have and certain people were going to be invited. So it was fascinating because he was basically laying out, setting up all these different groups in different countries. So I think it probably has more to do with that, actually having these different UFO or UAP groups in different international communities that can kind of handle um, networking for disclosure issues for him specifically, and also for the U S to be connected internationally. And he did say in this video that one of the things that he was kind of mandated to do was with his disclosure efforts to be working internationally, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. I, and I know he's always wanted to take this subject more internationally, trying to get, you know, the five eyes countries on board, trying to get, you know, places, uh, like San Marino on board. So I find it very intriguing that, you know, he, he, 
he's working his way through these countries. Italy is another one that we know he has spoken to. So, I mean, this is an international topic anyways, you know, it, it, it really is. And I'm, I'm just curious where this is going to go. Cause we're all anticipating his book to come out this year and whether or not it does, but it seems like maybe the, the production and the, and the, what's the word I'm looking for. And the, the, advertising of everything has begun for him to return to the ufo world i think with the website being up and running taking um subscribers through the website that's surely an indication that he's building subscribers in order to launch um launch the book and launch the film project in order for media down the road and maybe he will be doing some kind of media group i don't know but that's what the website kind of indicated that he was going to have a media platform so that if he has a media platform and he raises those subscribers he'll be able to announce that all on his own all on his own website through his media platform so we'll see i gotta tell you i am really really looking forward to this book i don't buy a lot of books you know but this one i could tell you i am very much looking forward to that very much looking forward to it i'm just i'm curious i'm curious and i'm wondering you know how many how many different types of 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 stories he's going to tell not only about his his military experience but his ufo experiences as well yeah like why would he need subscribers i mean if he comes out with the book it's going to be you know so popular but and, you know, in terms of marketing, they always say it's good to have your own subscriber list. It's it's good to have your own contacts that you can send information to directly rather than working through other sources. And so, I mean, I think that's a no brainer that he's going to have, you know, a huge bestseller. You know, he doesn't need to have subscribers. But if you want to have control over your list, you want to have a list to start with. Well, it's going to be interesting because he, I'm sure with the, the delays on the, on the book, you know, are due to the fact that he's probably got to get some, some things cleared before he could release it. And I'm sure there's been a lot of editing going on to make sure that he's not saying anything that breaks his uh, NDAs. So hopefully what we're hearing is maybe the end of summer, it could come out, you know, and whether or not legally he's allowed to publish it. We're going to see. It's going to be interesting. Do you think it comes out this year? No. <laughs> I, I did initially. If I were to put money on it, I would have said yes. But now I think no. And and the only reason why is because the hesitation around it, that there, there might either still be a Dopser process or something that we don't know about. Um, I would have said, yeah, I thought it's coming in the fall. And I also would have said that I would have thought that there was a documentary coming you know, um, just shortly after that and that it was, you know, tied to the election season. But now I'm, I'm not so sure. I don't know what's holding it up and no one's saying. So that leads me to believe that maybe not. We're already in April already, you know, they would be, they would be promoting it pretty heavily if it was to come out. So far, that's why I think there's probably some sort of issues around his NDAs or legalities and what he's allowed to say and what not to say, because I'm sure the alphabet agencies will be going through that book with a fine tooth comb. That's for sure. Courtney Marcusani continues with UFO court on spaced out radio right after this. Stay tuned, everybody. This is spaced out radio and your host, Dave Scott. There we go. There we go. Hey, hoping my internet holds up for me. Well, it's holding up so far, and your hair looks great. <laughs> Thanks. My my signature curly hair. <clears throat> well, it's going to be interesting. Gonna be interesting. Where do we want to go next? 
Did you see all the stuff that I posted in the news chat? <clears throat> I did. Okay, well, I, I think did. we have to touch on 60 Minutes and Havana Syndrome. Sure. We'll go there next. Yeah, I think that's important. I think so. I didn't get a chance to um, to see that. I did, so I can do a breakdown for you. Yeah. I watched it with my family, and um, you know they were they were wondering, you know, what's uh, why does she want to watch this? You know, like what's important about it? And so they were saying, you know, what what should we expect with this? And I was like, well, and I broke down you know, what happened in Havana, Cuba. And then I went into AHI and the legislation. And sure enough, you know, when CBS come out, came on, they broke it all down and they were like, wow, you've really stayed on top of this. And I was like, yeah, well, it's important, you know, and it's really, uh, it really is important. And so I think we here at Spaced Out Radio probably have a little bit of an edge, you know, on other people because I was involved with the UAP Medical Coalition and that was one of our initiatives that we were following in following in DC. So we have a bit of a, you know, we have a bit of a lead on the reporting. I'm getting closer to finding the local Skinwalker Ranch around here. Oh, really? Did you see that I posted the pilot communications up uh, up there above Winnipeg? Yeah, I did. I did. We could get to that if we have some time. Yeah, I, um, I've i been searching. I'd heard rumors that there was a potential, not Skinwalker Ranch, but Activity Ranch around here, around oh, how my place. Far, how far, like within a day's drive of you or farther? Oh, within, within, a, within a couple hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm uh, in the process of... of getting it confirmed you know you just got to go hang out with the gun people to figure this one out i saw but you with the guns i was really curious what that was all about well, we were at the <laughs> we're at the you're feeling about you know riflery and weapons well i i'm i'm in the process of getting my pal okay which is a canadian firearms license so i'm in the process of of doing that right now and um i decided to go to the range with my buddies so that's what we did went to the went to the shooting range and uh shot up a bunch of stuff blew off a bunch of ammo and it was fun oh good i'm glad you were able to get out and have some fun yeah you know as joe would say i got my my own pointy sticks now <laughs> Well, when you when you get into the gun community, you um, there's levels, you know, there's levels of like en encyclopedic knowledge of guns, historical weapons, you know, it's like going down a whole nother rabbit hole. So prepare yourself. Oh yeah, so I'm already prepared, and you know, it's funny because my buddy Mark, who's my best friend, he um, he always whines and complains to me about how nothing strange ever happened to him until he started hanging out with me. And well, so I think that's I, a thing that happens with experiencers is they sometimes kick yep. off, you know, they activate stuff. Oh, yeah. other people. So I fired back at Mark and I said, pun intended, <laughs> by the way. And I said, <laughs> well, I had no interest in guns until I met you. So, you know, there you go exactly we were raised exactly. with them like you know we grew up around them so you had to learn you had to learn all about them mm -hmm. dark starry sky saying carry a shotgun dave when you're in the woods around here oh i know i know it's well, all back in the day, we used to have in our pickup trucks we used to have a rack what we call it yeah well, i mean i i haven't seen that anymore but that's like real country Really? All right. Thank you to T-Bone with the hat trick, Deb, W. Decker, Deidre, CS, and Lavira for the super chats. Here we go, everybody. In like five seconds. All right. 
final half hour, Spaced Out Radio and UFO Court continues right now. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate you hanging on out with us. want to remind you that if you missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. UFO Court is back in session. Courtney Marcassani is here. By the way, I really do like calling it UFO Court much better. It's just much more fun. Do you now? All right, good. It took a while, huh? We finally found our we finally found our claim to fame. Yes. <laughs> Changing everything. Yeah, I, yeah, I gotta I gotta get a t shirt made of you on a put on our website with a, like a gavel and call it UFO court on there. A UFO with a gavel. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what I'm gonna do. Time to adjudicate. Time to litigate. Right. <laughs> All right, let's get down to it. A lot of people talking in our community about the 60-minute segment about Havana Syndrome. For people who may not know what Havana Syndrome is, give us a brief history on this. Well, CBS had had some ongoing reporting about the the strike at the... uh, it was at the embassy in Cuba and CBS did a series of reporting after it about injuries that had happened from um, acoustic weaponry potentially, but the people that were U S ambassadors and people who were in the U S embassy, they had all had specific types of injuries, hearing, um, hearing strange sounds. In some cases, there were injuries, brain injuries. And so recently it was really curious because the New York times and a couple other major news sources said that there were no brain injuries from Havana syndrome because it was called Havana syndrome because of the embassy attack. And so, you know, recently there's been some click conflictual reporting. So on Sunday, there was this big, big buildup into CBS's reporting about um, victims, witnesses who have been directly attacked. And it's called anomalous health incidents now um, in the NDA and in other reporting, they've changed it from Havana syndrome over to AHI. Very interesting indeed. You know, what were some of the victims saying that had happened to them? They heard a sound. They felt pressure on whatever side of their head was facing towards the weapon. Um, they felt like it was a, a piercing headache. It felt like a drill was drilling through their eardrums. And, um, and there was pain and pressure, which resulted in both the cases that they covered in hospitalization and in the one, um, intelligent agents, um, in her case, she actually had to have a plate put in her head, um, because there was a hole that was essentially, um, created in her eardrum. So she still has, I think, one more surgery. They said she had two to have the plate put in and she has one more surgery. Oh my. Yeah. And so here's what they said. I wrote some notes down during the CBS reporting. They said it was focused microwave or acoustic ultrasound. And they also featured the lawyer for the intelligence community clients hit with the Havana syndrome. And they called it a war of shadows. Um, so the other person that was interviewed in the CBS reporting, um, he's a very important and compelling witness as well. His name was Greg Ed Green, ran the investigation for the Defense Intelligence Agency. He would not discuss classified information, but he described his team's work from 2001 to 2023. Uh, he also started... Um, an organization after leaving the intelligence community for Havana syndrome. But he said, we're collecting a large body of data ranging from signals, intelligence, human intelligence, and open source reporting. And um, so they tied the report during the CBS uh, investigation into Russia 
because the one FBI agent who went on the record, they didn't say her name, but they did feature her and she, they changed her appearance. She talked about um, getting involved in a case that was a Russian operative. And what, what essentially happened is they chased this guy down in Florida on a major highway. And when they went and went through his car and it was a high speed chase, they eventually put, um, you know, things across the roads that would puncture his tires to get him to stop. They found a passport, Russian passport, all kinds of documents with account numbers on it and a little, a little tiny handheld device that they didn't know what it was. And so that led to more investigations and they found that he was a Russian operative. He was put in jail here in the U.S., served some time and then went back to Russia and he was supposedly killed. So she did that whole investigation on him and they connected the the Havana syndrome with her case to Russia. And then there was another, <clears throat> another agent that was over in a United Nations summit and she was also hit by a Russian operative. And they went through the whole connection that these Russian operatives had to political figures and that why they would have hit these different agents. And it was because they were highly successful with their Russian investigations for the U.S., that is scary. That is scary that there is weaponry out there that could possibly do this. Now, there has been a lot of talk around the UFO community about Havana syndrome. Does this differ from what other people are going through? It's definitely complex. You know, on my on my Twitter page, I, you know, listed out my involvement somewhat. And my perspective, working with UAP Medical Coalition, I put the document, the DIA document that Kit Green had done for OSAP when he was a contractor, the subacute field effects. I loaded that up online so people could have that as a reference tool. And um, I'm, I'm surprised that not, not many people had seen that document or read it. So that has opened up some inquiries into these effects. It doesn't say, the DIA document doesn't say that this is Havana syndrome, but it does go into the history of Kit Green's looking into injuries from aerospace tech. And so there is a connection. There is similar types of effects, heat, burn, rashes, um, tinnitus, um, paresthesias, which is like a pin prickling feeling. Um, like pins and needles. And so he goes through a wide range of the symptoms. So there's definitely overlap. But skeptics that look at that history of OSAP and look at that document say, no, it's different. It's not the same. And then other detractors say, look, they said it's Russia. Well, we don't know that. And there is also a huge cover up. They said that on CBS News as well, that two reports from the US have come out and said there are no injuries. That's where the New York Times got their reporting from. So once again, there's a cover up and we don't know why. Do you think it's because the US government may have this weaponry as well or perfected it and yes. therefore they don't want to give the secret up? Yeah, and Kit Green pretty much has said that. He did. Um, UFO Joe Mergia had an interview with Kit Green a couple years back that I read in detail, trying to see what where he was landing with his his own analysis of these injuries. And he said he believed it was secret tech that we have. Would that be like microwave type of weaponry? Yeah, he lists that in his report. I encourage everybody to go read the subacute field field effects report that I loaded up on Twitter today. If you're interested in it, he goes into that. He also talks about microwave weaponry and acoustic radio frequency weaponry. Kit Green does. And that goes back all the way into OSAP. It predates all of this that's happening right now. Wow. How does one know if they've been hit by this type of weaponry? You and be, because of UFOs or or because of those involved with UFOs. When I watched the Mupas interview that we we covered a couple weeks ago about these different types of anomalies that happen around the experiencers, there is some overlap. And when his interview questioned him, Jim Sagala, he said, "There's no possible way 
that this could be because you'd have to have this accelerator outside somebody's house loaded up into a van and it would be too huge. And so he negated that whole argument for people. How would they, how would they be being hit? And so there is one of the discrepancies in the reporting and from a scientific am, angle that I'm seeing, you know, in the CBS, you know, reporting, it was a small handheld device that they showed on the ground outside of the car. So I'm not exactly sure that Jim Segala's, you know, up to date on that, but people should definitely look for things like burns, burns on the hands, the skin, the feet, anywhere on the body, tinnitus, ear ringing, piercing, um, anything that affects your perception, your vestibular system, which is like your movement, your balance, anything like that, you should have it checked out. There's no doubt to follow up on it because you're not going to know. And so everybody in the UFO community has had similar experiences. Everybody's reporting this, that they hear sounds, tones, um, but it depends on the extent and if there's an actual injury. So if there is an injury, you should definitely follow up, follow up on it and be seen medically. Hmm. Okay. So with that happening, do we see this also affecting uh, any type of mental issues or stress that could be caused from this? Yeah. I mean, in the two, in the two agents that they talked to their lives are, were changed and the one woman's family was also hit in, in her house. It affected her children. And so the scary thing about all this is that you don't necessarily know, especially if this is something like it could be a handheld device just outside of your house. So that's the scary part. The second part is this is really damaging to our own intelligence communities in the U S because they didn't hit people that were unknown. They hit, they hit highly successful intelligence officers who are very good at their job to take them out of the field. So that's the other thing that's really deeply concerning and could also lead to why the U S isn't wanting to talk about this openly because it's a, it's got a fear factor involved with because the level of the damage and how these people lie, their lives were affected and their families and they can't pr be protected. That's the other really big scary part i think watching it that was one of my takeaways i can see that being an absolute fear as well i mean my goodness could you imagine just sitting in your back uh, patio watching the kids play on the trampoline and then all of a sudden some type of weaponry comes at you and you don't even know you've been hit until you start feeling the effects that is scary scary stuff well, you and I were, you and I, I think you and I were in the group at the same time. We were in a high level group two years ago when one of the American scientists had been um, injured by these direct energy weapons. Do you remember that? Were you in the group at the time or were you, were you not I, in there? I don't think so. I think I had been booted out at that point. Well, there was a there was a scientist in um, Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama, and she was showing pictures, documentation. She thought she was being attacked by these direct energy weapons. She was in her house. She had to move uh, out of her apartment with her boyfriend, in with her parents because she'd had multiple break-ins, harassment, and so her name was Amy Estridge, and she was trying to talk to people in the community about this and share this. And then of course she passed away under mysterious circumstances, but her case should be reopened and investigated again. Yeah. There's a lot of high strangeness around hers and she had a lot of very brilliant friends within the community. You know, that is a story that I don't think, I, I think has passed through a lot of people, you know, without even a second blink of an eye, unfortunately. That's for sure. There were a lot of people that were in Huntsville that knew her. She was a familiar person. I think the 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 questioning in her um, untimely death was when she was talking about coming out during disclosure. And so what I didn't know back then, two years ago, when we were in that group, is that she was already in communication with people who were going to testify in the hearing, in the hearing on... Uh, with David Grosh. And so she was giving information and helping. And then recently a interview of her just dropped when she was talking about going out and getting out in the public to help keep herself safe. 
um, of what she knew because she was behind closed doors developing technology and she wanted to come out with it because she wanted to share what she knew about anti-gravitics. And she was talking about, you know, things that people think are really, really wild concepts. But in this recent interview that the, that dropped, she was talking about the secret space program. And, um, you know, these are things that if somebody were to hit Amy with a directed energy weapon, why would they do it? Who would do it? What would be the reasoning behind it? At the time, from what I understand, she thought it was either China, Russia, or the U.S. So I think it's important not to forget her case, to continue to understand that dues were related in her case, and that it's unresolved. And there are people that were working on it. And I think we need to not forget, you know, Havana syndrome in her specific case. It's important. Very important indeed. Let's get to some UFO sightings as we got about five minutes to go here. Somewhere in the middle of Manitoba by Winnipeg, there were some pilots who saw some things or some lights, people who saw lights. Yeah, I posted this in our, our news group and our news uh, research community. There were pilots above Winnipeg. There were lights in the sky, and you hear one female pilot calling in another female or another pilot asking about military, if there's a military range around there, um, because she's seeing lights in the sky and a lot of activity. And then the other pilot chimes in and says, no, you know, we don't see anything. You're not near a military installation. So that warrants going and following up on. I post it in our group, um, but it's new information that, that just dropped. So people who are in Canada might be really interested in listening to that. Um, conversation between the pilots i didn't get through the whole thing before i came on tonight um but it's new a new case wow and, and you know what i'm gonna tell you i've talked to a lot of people and one of my sources actually has told me watch manitoba manitoba which is the central part of canada and the last of the prairie provinces heading east seems to have major UFO activity where a lot of these craft that are being seen just seem to morph out of nowhere over Manitoba and make their way through central and eastern part of the United States. It's very weird how Manitoba just keeps popping up, Courtney. What do you think that's about? Why do you think that you got the heads up and now we get this audio recording? I mean, what do you think? What do you think's happening? Here's the weird part. One of my military sources in Canada mentioned Manitoba to me. And two of my American sources have mentioned Manitoba to me. So what do you guys have up there? You know, if they've mentioned it in passing and keep your, you know, keep your eyes skyward. Is there anything there for tracking? You know, like we have UAPX or we have other types of mobile units that can go out and do some tracking. What do you guys have in, in Canada out there for picking it up and following it? We have polar bears. <laughs> Well, we That's do in Alaska have. too, but they're they're not they're not uh they're not close. You know, they're far out in the Arctic. Yeah, not not in Churchill, Manitoba, where they have to literally ban all white Halloween costumes, so that way uh, the kids don't get mixed up with with people thinking they're polar bears. You know, but uh, no. On a serious note, from what I have heard. Not from my Canadian sources, but my American sources, is that there is all sorts of secret watching going sky watching going on in Manitoba. And I think it's because it's directly south of North Dakota. And what's in North Dakota? Nuclear missiles. And maybe that has something to do with it. But there's been a lot of instances uh, of things happening. Sorry, I'm trying to hold back a sneeze here. Well, I'll just interject while you're sneezing that we have in, you know, in Montana, where I was just coming from, we have Maelstrom. And that was where one of the big, one of the big sightings was where the, 
Mm -hmm. you know, the power went down and the orb showed up out at the gate and they were freaked out. So yeah, that's close proximity. Yeah. So I think, I mean, don't forget Grant Cameron had his Charlie red star close mm -hmm. to the Manitoba and Amer or the Canadian American border. All right. And Charlie red star took off South over North Dakota. As weird as that is an oxymoron statement, South over North Dakota, weird, but it just seems to happen. Manitoba is a place to watch. And I, I, I believe I should go up there. I mean, I have my passport and I have my truck yeah. and I've, I've seen it a Canadian football league game there. And it was funny because all the Canadians were talking, talking smack about American football, how, you know, Canadians, you know, could take our football yeah. game. Yeah. Just getting there quiet, you know, cause I'm in Winnipeg just going, yeah, you guys, you you crazy Canadians. You think you could beat us at football? <laughs> we only need three downs to make 10 yards. I'm just going to tell you that. Don't need that fourth down. Yeah, so that's the last time I was in Winnipeg was at a Canadian football league. I was there to watch a friend of mine play from the University of Montana. He and I were good friends. Um, his name was Brian Ayat, and he was originally from Hawaii, and he came on scholarship to play at the University of Montana. So Nice. Courtney, we got to wrap it up. Thank you for a great UFO court. We'll talk to you in a couple days' time. And a big hello to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal. Rocking in the background when Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Space Now Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, Elga, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, the hashtag Space Down Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Down Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your sheets are always available. Your tickets never expire and if you want to bring a friend we've got room for them too good night hot damn that's a good theme song Damn good theme song. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Tim Mothman and your goatee for adding to the super chats tonight. Appreciate that. Can't wait to see you in just over a month. Don't forget, guys, you only have uh, nine days to let me know if you're coming to Reno for the fan party. Nine days because I have to get the VIP swag bags ready. That's what it comes down to, the VIP swag bags. You can meet Courtney there. Yeah, she's going to hold the UFO court there. She's bringing her gavel. Bringing her gavel. How big you is your gavel? You got my order, right? You got my order. I put my order in, didn't I? No, but I'll have something okay. for you. All right, well, I'll follow up. I best double check, because I thought I put my order in. Mm. Mm. I hear you. We'll get her done. It's quite all right. We shall get her done. <clears throat> so did you see that the news chat started to, to bump back up again with some? Yes. I'm uh, thankful for that. Okay, good. I wanted to just double check if that's where, because we can just oh, start. Yeah putting all the updates in there and you can just go into one source and check that all out. Yes. 
That's what we I'll start do, doing. We have to do some uh, spring cleaning in there. But once we do, I think it'll be okay. Yeah. It should be okay. Well, I've been in there for a long time, but, um, you know, it looks like a good time. I was thinking, oh, we could just put the news in here. So I started to put it in there for people that might yep. be interested, and I thought that was a good place. I like it. Yeah. I like it. You're so smart. So smart. You're the one that set it up, and you're the one that put all the, yeah. all the folks in there to share and collaborate. So we'll just be re-energizing it in again. We are adding new batteries as we speak. That's what we do around here. Add new batteries. When in doubt, change the batteries. Uh, we happened to co go through a small town called Gimli, Manitoba. They were celebrating their Viking heritage with games and good fun. Who knew? Gimli, Manitoba. I think there's a military base there but yeah speaking of like did were you given any kind of general location in manitoba where you should be focusing um, your attentions on or was it just general anywhere, province? anywhere now apparently in the 50s from what i learned apparently in the 50s there was a ufo crash there and by the time the canadian military got there the Americans were already there saying, we're taking this. And the Canadians said, um, no, you're not. That's ours. It's on our soil. And the Americans say, we don't care. We're taking it anyways. What are you going to do about it? Did Wilbur Smith cover that in his book? Was that part of his, his uh, documentary historical records? I'm not sure. We'd have to talk to... Grant or Nicole about that. Okay. Yeah. Somehow I don't think so. Well, I knew he was kind of one of your resident experts that was covering things long before, you know, it got really um, famous for lack of a better word as a topic that he was somebody that was covering it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, they seem to be a little bit quiet on discussing Manitoba. Um, but it sounds like it's a secret mission or something, you know? <laughs> like I can't help but like jumping to well, if they're telling you to watch out for it, that must be that there's some like intel. It, it's weird. They won't tell me the who, what, where, when, why, how. All yeah. they're saying is watch Manitoba. Manitoba seems to have a be a uh, uh, one second. T Bone is SOR still on MP McGuire's case on being a guest? Oh wow, oh, yeah. that would be great. Of course we are. Of course we are. Yeah, I. Uh, but there was a shift there because my contact for Larry has changed jobs, and I so that. I heard that as well. He moved on to a different uh, member of parliament. And so it, we're getting all straightened out here pretty quick. Yeah. He had a couple people with him from his office at the Soul Symposium. Yeah. And um, I met the one guy that, you know, was his go-to guy. I mean, sounds like a really effective high-level policy yeah. advisor. So it would be worth it to follow yeah. up with him. I bet wherever he goes, he's going to oh, yeah. continue on. Yeah, I uh, I talked to him a week ago. Did you? Oh yeah. Where did where did he land? Is he in the same party there? Oh, it's the same party. Uh, mm -hmm. One of his best friends ran for for um, office in a by election, mm -hmm. and so he ended up. Um, his buddy said, "Hey, you know, you got to come work." work for, for me and he talked to Larry about it and Larry said yeah not a problem go and with your host Dave Scott oh that's such a sexy voice um <laughs> and uh so there was a change that made there so um I gotta get back on the phone and start uh 
hammering the new guy. Well, I hope the new guy is receptive as the old guy was, because he sounded like he was pretty collaborative, pretty receptive. Yeah. Absolutely. I should see about getting Larry back on. Yeah, that'd be a good show. Well, we'll put a pin in the other news items for um, Wednesday night, and hopefully there will be more things to add to it. I know there was a lot we didn't get to, but. Yeah. How How's our friend out there? Have you met with that person yet? Talk to him. Yeah. yeah. He looks like he would have a really nice mustache. <laughs> Which friend are we talking about? <laughs> Now you've confused me. Our whistleblower friend. Yeah. No stash. No stash, but I I guess I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to tell I'm going to text him and tell him to could you please grow one because your voice totally sounds like you need a power mustache. He's got a great voice. Yeah. I got yeah. to see that. I like Joe's comment here. Canadians have two modes. 90% of the time they're polite. 10% of the time they're ripping their pads off and punching you in the face. I'll give you a little bit of Canadiana that happened today. And it's no April fool's joke. Uh, Our illustrious dear leader, uh, because I, you know, we're not allowed to really mention his name anymore without getting permission. And I don't even know if I'm being sarcastic on that anymore. <laughs> Our illustrious dear leader gave himself a $16,800 raise today annually. And he gave every member of parliament an $8,400 raise annually. In the meantime, um, Canadians got hit today with a 23% increase in the carbon tax. 23%, 23% increase and in, in, in that's unilateral all right across the board. Whoa. Everything we do now gets hit with a 23% increase in carbon tax. Well, I will say that <clears throat> I love Canada. I love my fellow Canadians. I, you know, I resonate with them, but do not talk hockey or football <laughs> with their I, Canadian I will, friends. Don't do it. I will say this, that when our next election happens next year, um, cause it's not going to happen any sooner because of the corruption in Ottawa right now. But if, 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 if dear leader, is to somehow gets elected again. Uh, I've already talked with my family. We're, we're moving. So it's so interesting because it's the same on the other side in the U S everybody is, it's so polarizing with our election season. Now everybody's saying they're moving to Canada and it's like, can it, Canada's will not have you. They're not, it's not interested in having an American. (laughs) It's not about, it's not about, the the thing with with Canada is it, compared to the U.S. is the U.S. people at least this is an outsider's perspective, okay? And I'm an outsider, but an outsider's perspective is you've made it very very personal. But I don't know the deep. I'm not saying you, but from what I see, it's become very very personal on it. And up here, it's that I can't afford to live. Right. Oh, Honestly, me, we can't, we can't afford to live here either. Nobody, you know, nobody can. the average house, the average house near Vancouver. Like if I were to se- have sold my house, when I sold my house down there, if you multiply that by three and a half, I would have sold my house down there to move up here for about $1.4 million. I bought my house down there and I thought it was expensive at the time at 400,000. Well, listen to this. My brother-in-law just came home today cause I'm here hanging out with my family before um, I have to run these big errands. Anyway, 
he was saying that he was he got a notice from Zillow about these houses outside of San Francisco, and there was a list of the top ten places that there were most the most uh, expensive, and the one town he said he looked in Zillow and there was nothing under four million. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, mm. who in there? Who can live there? You know, I mean, I'm just thinking about Silicon Valley and you know, how wealthy all these folks are. And it's like, it's just, it's not oh. a reality. I am taxed um, now. I am taxed from my income tax, my provincial tax, everything. I think I am taxed almost 60% of my salary now. Wow. Once you break it, once you break it all down. So my tax, I think I'm in a, uh, a 43 to 45% tax profile for salary. So right there, you split your check in half, but then you think of all the taxes that you're paying per month on everything from gas to food and everything. And it just goes up from there. And it's like, at what point, uh, you know, like uh, they're starting to do polls with the millennials who are now starting to realize up here that they will never, ever be able to um, ever be able to afford to buy a house. In fact, one yeah. politician did a poll with a bunch of millennials in her constituency uh, just this past weekend. And it was unanimous that 100% of the people there who are millennial say they'll never be able to afford a house in Canada. The average house. So the average house in British Columbia is, and this is if like my area would be different, but it's getting really bad. Um, the average house in Canada is eight hundred thousand dollars? Who the hell can afford eight hundred thousand for a house? Nobody, right? Nobody. No, like even really if you're making, even if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year after you're taxed and everything, it would take you twenty five plus years to save up a ten percent down payment. That's no vacations. No getaways, no frivolous spending, 25 years. That's how bad it is here now. Well, I did not realize it was that bad in Canada. Yeah. I, mean, I remember um, going in, and this was a heck of a long time ago, but when I lived in Montana, I remember going up to a town called Fernie. Yeah. And Fernie was a really cool place where we would all go up and ski and then you know come back down. And man it was little known and things were affordable and it was like this perfect little heaven in Canada. But I bet if you go back and look at Fernie now, it's probably the same thing. You probably can't afford anything. Yeah. Can't you can't afford anything. And so what's happening is a lot of, a lot of British Columbians are now, you know, it's, it's much like the exodus out of California. M many British Columbians now are moving to, to Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even Manitoba just to get out of it because like we are charged 7% uh, provincial sales tax on top of a federal 5% goods and services tax. Plus now we got to pay a 23% carbon tax. Boy, that's a killer. You know, the worst part about it is British Columbia if you took our, this is where the bullshit lies. And I'm not a climate conspiracist or anything, okay? But this is where the bullshit lies. British Columbia has enough trees on it, in it, to neutralize British Columbia's carbon footprint. But they still tax us on it. And British Columbia is one of the only provinces in Canada, there's only 13, 12, 10 provinces that the premier and or in the American case, it'd be a governor um, 
will not give the carbon tax rebate to the citizens. Yeah, we have similar things like that, where in Alaska, we have one of the biggest non-contiguous or contiguous forests in North America, yeah. in Wrangell, you know, national forest there. And we don't get anything like that either for, you know, yeah. for breaks to have one of the largest forests in North America. Uh, but I know, I mean, that's a shame considering, you know, other countries, they're not monitoring it. You know, that's always, you know, my debate because I am very, you know, pro-environment and, um, you know, looking into the climate emergency that's happening. But there's other there's other places in the world that don't don't even try to regulate it. India, well, exactly. China, they're the not key. trying to regulate their emissions, you know, and so here we are trying to be careful and planning out a plan for climate, you know, over the next 50 to 100 years. And other countries aren't even putting their best foot forward. So it's really a zero sum game to some degree. Here's the problem between Canada and the U S the U S is, I think quintuple the carbon footprint of Canada, but that's due to population mainly. But in Canada, our carbon footprint is so small already that they're taxing the hell out of us in order to pay for emissions that we're not even creating. And until China, Russia, India, and even the U S start to take it seriously, because those are the big four are we're taxing the hell out of people. Like Canada has a record amount of people right now using food banks. And kids are now going to school to get meals because mom and dad can no longer afford to pack them a lunch. We have the same. We have the same social economical issues. Yeah. Very similar. Especially in the, especially in, you know, urban areas, there is, um, there's a lot of social economic issues. So yeah. that's so, on par. I know we're looking like, like for instance, if I can, if, if the uh, dear leader gets reelected somehow by the unholy chance of, that God hates Canada. Okay. I like, we're literally putting our house up for sale and looking to buy property elsewhere because you, you go to some of these countries where you know, let's say you, you sell your house for a two hundred thousand dollar profit, you could still get a nice piece of land and have money in the bank afterwards. You know. Well, it's interesting that you still have places that have affordability. Those are kind of drying up in the U.S. Um, yeah, I, and we might be on the cusp of another bubble, another housing bubble where it's all going to bust. But yeah. If you sell your place and your land that you've had for 30 years or even longer, you know, you're, you're getting into a, you're getting into a, a shell game where you might not be able to buy something even comparable. So, yeah. but it sounds like you might have options for affordability still in your region. Or in your <laughs> oh, land. I'm looking, I'm looking. I even thought about that, uh, that, that little town in Italy, that <laughs> literally, you know, they're, they're paying you to come buy land in their towns, you know, they're paying you and they're giving you free land, you know? So it's like, Hmm, would I do well in Italy? Okay. Can't go near the ocean because there's sharks there, you know? And, uh, but you could have a great garden and you could grow tomatoes and, you know, you could have a couple of sheep. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, it really depends on the kind of quality of life you want to have, and you do have to make sacrifices. I think we're all going to have to make sacrifices in the coming future for things. Um, yeah, we're going to have yeah. to we're going to have to live off the land maybe a little more and become a little bit more resilient. Yeah, I think I I, I honestly was thinking someplace in Central America like Costa Rica or Guatemala or Panama. I had a place in Costa Rica for 10 years. So if you look at going down there, please let me know. I have a huge community of friends that are still there. Well, it's because 
my partner can work from home. Mm-hmm. Well, she does work from home. Mm-hmm. And I could do the radio show. Yeah. And that would be like down in one of those places. That would be plenty of money per month for us to live off of in the meantime, you know, go from there. Well, Costa but- Rica has its problems, you know, I'm not going to lie. You know, I um, I dealt with the politics in Costa Rica and dealing with, you know, having a place there. And it it is difficult. But if you get to know the right people, they're very welcoming and um it's 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 more expensive there too though it used to be a place that you know was affordable yeah. and it's not so much anymore but it is no. relatively it, safe especially the last 10 years it's really skyrocketed on property and everything i've been doing my research yeah you well know. let me know let me know if you look into that because like i said i know i know good people in costa rica for sure yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll just pick up the family and move to Thailand or someplace else where you're not taxed to hell, you know? It's Vietnam. Vietnam's a new place? Yeah, Vietnam is the place where it's affordable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Portugal. I heard Portugal is the other place is really affordable. Yes. I, I don't know that. That's just people who have been investigating similar things like you are. All places to hold on to live in the world. All right. Um, Colombia is number one, Thailand number two, Malaysia number three, Ecuador number four, Mexico number five. See, I just I don't like cocaine. That's my problem. Right? Never done it. And three of the five countries there are cocaine destinations. Yeah, I have had some friends actually who have moved to moved to Colombia for that reason because of the affordability, and in Bogota. Yeah. Yeah. What's the cheapest and nicest place to live? This according to Google. Uh, in the U.S., it's Montgomery, Alabama. Pittsburgh is on that list. Little Rock, Arkansas, Daytona, or Dayton, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't want the U.S. I want. I just drove through Dayton and around Pittsburgh. So. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's funny. All right. According to the cheapest country, according to International Living's annual global retirement index, Costa Rica is the most affordable and desirable place to live. And it was voted happiest place on earth like three years in a row. And there's blue zones there. There's a couple blue zones where, you know, people who live in the blue zones, the Nicoya Peninsula is one of them. People live longer. What is the blue zone? Blue zones are places around the around the world globally that people live longer and are healthier and they have lower morbidity into their older years, which means they don't have as many health complications growing older. Mm. They're healthier. What's the medical like down there? It's a little it's it's a little more open than the US in many ways and definitely cheaper. Medical things are cheaper, dental's cheaper. Surgery. Some people go to Costa Rica to have medical surgeries because it's cheaper for them as Americans. Let's see. For their American dollar, it's cheaper. What's the average price of a home in Costa Rica? Well, let's take a look. Um, Let's see. If you live in the metropolitan area of San Jose, the average price of a house is $180,000 U.S. dollars. Yeah, and uh, San Jose and Heredia uh, above Heredia, H E R E D I A. That would also be a, a good place to live. It's north, northeast of San Jose. I mean, there's a bunch of a bunch of places around San Jose. I wouldn't personally want to live in San Jose because I'm more of a country girl, um, mm-hmm. you know. But there's other places around. And look at the south. Look in the south, like San Diego. See, where I'm like screwed. That. Where I'm screwed is in the jungles there. You got some big freaking snakes in there. Okay. Yeah. So the answer to that is to like break bottles and put 
put down like cement so you have bottles all around where you sleep so they can't come up and get in while you're sleeping. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're in the jungle, you got snakes. If you're near the water, you got great whites. I'm screwed there. Well, I'm but you screwed. have you have the rainforest and you can hear the cicadas when they come out and you can see sloths. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the white teen, face monkeys oh. and the mono TT monkeys, the capuchin monkeys. I mean, there's a lot. There's huge, huge things of hydrangea bushes with flowers growing out that are just it's nuts. No. It's it's amazing. No. Screw that. Big snakes. Big snakes. Dave, look at Matapalo. Look at Matapalo. Matapalo would be a great place for you. M-A-T-A-P-A-L-O. And your partner. All right, let me check here. Uh, let's go to pointtohomes.com. Let's check it on out. Oh, private ocean and mountain view paradise, 22 acres. And they have a right. whole community that runs off of solar. I mean, and I mean, Matapalo is really cool. Okay, this is a gorgeous area. Yeah. All right. But once again, it used to be affordable. I don't know if is if it is anymore. Matapalo might not be affordable now. Well, let me tell you something about my area where I live. When I first moved up here, you could buy nine years ago. You could buy an acre of ten, of land in my area for twenty to thirty thousand dollars an acre. Okay, today that acre is worth a hundred and twenty to one hundred sixty thousand. It's before you build on it. My community. And I love it here. I do. I'm in heaven. For for the weird crap, I am in heaven here. I just don't know. Like I said, um, I just need to wait until the next election. When the next election happens, that's when I'll figure stuff out. Yeah, British Columbia is insanely beautiful. I mean, it's just it's just an incredible place. Oh, it's insanely beautiful. The yeah. average price of a home in British Columbia. So the average price of a home in British Columbia as of 2022 is $996,460. Over double the national average. And Vancouver now is the second highest. I think New York is number one. Vancouver is number two for real no. estate. Costs. Get out. Really? Vancouver? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I knew New York, of course, but I thought like Alaska and Hawaii were up there. I didn't think yeah. that Vancouver was in the top three or even yeah, five. It, just, it literally just hit number two. Dear Lord. Yep. Yeah, dude. It's brutal. Brutal. But on that yeah. note, yes. I'm not bad. Make your choices. I am too. I will see you on Wednesday night. Thanks for a good you will. a good you will. Night. Thank you, Courtney, for everything. And tomorrow night on the show, Geraldine Orozco will be here for the spiritual you. And thank you tonight to T-Bone with a hat trick, Lavira times two, Tim Mothman and his goatee, Deborah Rooney, CS, Deidre, and W. Decker for the super chats tonight. We'll see you all tomorrow, everybody. Much love. Take care.
Stay healthy, my friend. You too. If you need bail money, give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.